Good morning and a warm welcome to all the delegates on this final day of our Mahapedicon 2022 conference. To commence our morning session, I would like to invite on stage our chairperson for this session, Dr. Sonali Shirbate, ma'am. Our first speaker for this morning is Dr. Indu Khosla, ma'am. Of all the adventitious sounds encountered by the pediatrician, the one that really makes us sit up and take notice is the strider. From epiglottitis to croup, from foreign body to neurological conditions, the strider brings with it a, a sense of urgency and sometimes outright panic. To disentangle this web of confusion and to bring order to this chaos, I hand over the mic to Dr. Indu Khosla, ma'am, for her topic, Taking Strider in Your Stride. Welcome. Good morning, friends, um, and thank you all for being present here in the morning today after the lovely banquet that we had last night. Uh, I'm going to talk about taking strider in your stride. Uh, we have all witnessed a huge amount of respiratory uh, infections, symptomology in the last four to six months. And many a times you have seen children with strider coming to our clinics. Uh, so I, I would talk to you about the common and the uncommon causes of strider, when you should think that this is not the routine run of the mill strider, and when you should further deep look into this child and look for uh, further investigations. So I would take you back to, uh, doc, uh, Ms. Uh, he was not a doctor, he was Daniel Bernoulli, who, who spoke about the Bernoulli principle. So what he said was higher the speed of flow, whether it is air or liquid, he of course um, uh, spoke about liquid, there is lower pressure. So quickly as the liquid will go past, the pressure that it will exert onto the walls of the of wherever the wherever the liquid is flowing will be lesser and vice versa is true so when you have an obstruction okay here you have a high speed and you have an obstruction here when you and and when you go past this obstruction the area uh, the focal area distilled to this obstruction will have low pressure and because it has come in high speed and the pressure will be low here because of the vacuum created. And this low pressure causes a squeaky, a, you know, a squeaking, a squeaking sound, which is caused because the airway walls collapse and they vibrate. So this is your pathophysiology of a strider. So strider can be uh, either extrathoracic or intrathoracic. And in the extrathoracic also, it could be supraglottic or at the uh, glottic level and of course you have the intrathoracic variety the supraglottic area starts from the nasopharynx right up to the false vocal cord now this is a very special area why i call it a special area because this is an area which has to do multiple functions it has to allow you to breathe it has to allow you to swallow food okay and also speech so it is extremely a complex area and a balance has to be maintained to top it all because it has to do all these three functions there is no cartilage there therefore this area can collapse very very easily and then you have the glottic area and the in, uh, in, uh, and the intra uh, intra infraglottic area why we should know this is because the causes of strider are different Bit in all this area and, dip, and also the type of strider is different. So if you have a supraglottic strider, then you will have more of an inspiratory strider. If you have a strider at the glottic level, you will have generally a biphasic or an inspiratory strider. But if you have an infraglottic strider, you have an expiratory strider. So just by knowing the type of strider, you will know, you will have a guesstimate to understand from where the strider is originating. Okay, you should also look at the causes of the strider. This is straight from a textbook. So you could have an acute or a subacute strider. You could have a chronic strider, which could be congenital or it could be acquired. So in our day-to-day -day practice, I'm sure in the last four or five months, you, got, you have seen a lot of children who have come with a laryngitic cough, an uh, inspiratory strider, and most of it was probably because of an infection caused by parainfluenza, which is the common bug which can cause a uh, laryngitis and a, and a strider. So you could have a simple croup viral, which is the most common. You could have recurrent spasmodic, again, which is well described, exposure to a blast of cold air, and then you have other causes. What I've highlighted are which are common, 
You could have an anaphylaxis and a child can present with a strider. You could have a post extubation strider. Many of you must have ventilated children. The moment you extubate them, they would have a strider. Chronic strider, laryngomalacia is the commonest, focal cord palsies, which could be either congenital or acquired, um, subglottic stenosis, post ventilation or even primary. And chronic acquired striders could be, again, the same list. And hypocalcemic striders, another thing which you should not forget. So what I've highlighted are the common ones, but there are many other reasons why you can get a strider. So when you, when you approach a child with a strider, your initial approach should be first to judge how the child is, how the child's clinical condition is, airway, breathing, and circulation. So if you have a child with mild symptoms, this is a kid, you will hear a strider only when the child is uh, when the child is active, you'll hear a strider. Otherwise, there will be no strider in, in, this, in this child. And you, his voice will be good. He will be active. He'll be playful. Only in deep activity, you'll hear the strider. There will be no respiratory distress. This is mild. Moderate would be, there would be some respiratory distress. There would be tachypnea. There can be hypo hypoxemia. You can hear a strider even without your stethoscope. And if I were to ask you, where do you hear for a strider? Anybody in the audience, how do you hear for a strider? If you use your stethoscope, where should you hear a strider? So your stethoscope should be on your neck and that's the best place to hear a strider, okay? So if the child has a moderate amount of uh, distress or strider, he would can be hypoxemic, he will have respiratory distress, he could have tachypnea, and it will be an audible strider even without a stethoscope. In a child with severe strider, it will be worse. There will be worsening of respiratory distress. There could be grunting, there could be tachypnea, and this child would be obtunded because, and because of the severe, uh, severe respiratory distress that the child is. So first you need to assess what you need to do with this child, then go on to a detailed history to understand whether it, when did it start, whether it's subacute, whether it's recurrent, what, when, which age did it start? Whether it's in, then you look whether it's inspiratory, biphasic, or expiratory, which will tell you from where the strider is originating. Try to understand if you can find out the etiology. And if the child is failing to thrive, the child is failing to thrive, this is something, something which is going on for some time, and this is not a good strider to have if there are any associated malformations, uh, say like a cardiac malformation, or et cetera, which could tell you there's some syndrome which could have a strider. So this is how you would approach a patient, and then you will decide which strider needs investigations and evaluation, and which strider can just be left alone. So I'm going to take you through cases, and these are all cases from my clinic, which I've, over the years, which I have handled with strider. So this is a three-year-old who came with fever, noisy breathing with inspiration. He had a change in cry, which appeared painful, right? But he was active and playful. He had a loud barking cough, high-pitched inspiratory noise on coughing and crying, which disappeared on rest. He had mild rhinitis. So what do you think this child has? A barking cough, mild rhinitis, otherwise active and playful. Yes. So most likely, this is likely to be a group. So again, going back to the drawing board, look whether it's supraglottic or infraglottic. How do you differentiate a supraglottic strider from an infraglottic, even by simple symptoms? So if you have drooling of saliva and the strider is soft, and the child is toxic, it is more likely to be supraglottic because the causes could be a peritonsillar abscess, do not forget diphtheria, a foreign body which has just gone and launched, retropharyngeal abscesses we see less, but of course we must keep in mind, epiglottitis we don't see much in our country. But if you have a barking cough and a significant strider, it's more likely to be infraglottic. Think of laryngotracheobronchitis, diphtheria can come here, foreign body can also come here, and bacterial tracheitis in an immune compromised sick child where you could have staphylococcal infection of the, of the trachea. So this way also you can, so you can also differentiate from where the strider is coming. And this is a simple table which can help you differentiate from croup to a retropharyngeal abscess, bacterial tracheitis and epiglottitis. So our kid here, he was an active, playful child with the noisy breathing, which appeared painful, but which actually was not because the child was playful. The onset in a croup is gradual over days, maybe two, three days. He looks well. There may be mild fever. Cough is barking and loud. Strider is harsh. There may be some URI, 
symptoms get worse on activity. And if you take an X-ray, you see a steeple sign, but is, is X-ray required for diagnosis? The answer is no. In fact, such a child who has a strider, you may not, in fact, X-rays are not recommended because if, especially if the strider is not mild, it's moderate or severe, taking him through the process of an X-ray would actually be harmful to the child than doing good. In a retropharyngeal abscess, <clears throat> this is a sick child, gradual progression, minimal cough, and this child will have a stiff neck. He will hold his neck because the abscess is painful. He doesn't want to move his neck. He may have a torticollis position. If you take an X-ray here, the pre-vertebral space will be widened because of the abscess. Tracheitis is a very sick child. Again, a gradual progression, barking cough. There could be pain on swallowing. And this child's trach, if you take a plain X-ray, the tracheal lumen will be narrow and you see irregularity of the tracheal lumen. Fortunately, we don't see epiglottitis in our country. This is sudden onset, it's a life-threatening emergency. The child might drool, may sit in a tripod position, and you will see a swollen epiglottis. But of course, do not attempt to see the throat of these kids. So our kid definitely, as you all rightly diagnosed, had a croup. You must go on to uh, grade the severity based on the child's appearance, whether the strider is on rest, or on activity, or it is, or it's very, or it's at rest and worsening with agitation. Look at respiratory distress. Look at saturation. Based on that, you can classify your stride as mild, moderate, or severe, and you would accordingly treat. Hydrate all. Antipyretics for all. Oxygen for moderate to severe. Uh, Budesonide nebulization, nebulizations or dexamethasone can be given uh, given to all. In fact, dexamethasone is a drug of choice. You can use prednisolone also. It helps in all the three varieties of strider. You would use adrenaline nebulizations only in the ones who have severe strider, no role of antibiotics, and no role of uh, uh, PPIs. Let me take you through a second case. This is a five-month-old came with a brassy cough since one week. I remember this patient that come to me from Calcutta, and he had worsening tachypnea since one week. It was a healthy five-month-old, weighing almost 6.5 kg. Oops. What happened here? Huh. Okay. No fever, well-grown, no cold cough, no sick contacts. And suddenly he became tachypnic and his stride, he had an inspiratory strider, had a respiratory rate of 66 per minute. And his chest was clear. This was his uh, photograph. You can see this healthy kid. And he had a hemangioma sitting on his nose. What do you think this child had? Any guesses? So this is a giveaway, okay? If you have hemangioma on the body, especially in the beard area. 50% of children who have hemangioma in the beard area will have a hemangioma sitting in the airway. And if this is a child is symptomatic uh, who has developed a tachypnea and respiratory distress. So if you can see here, the, you can see this reddish area. We have gone through the vocal cords and this was a hemangioma, which was almost obstructing his airways. And this was a child who had a hemangioma in the airway. So if you have a hemangioma on the face, on the beard area, be watchful for this. This child can have a hemangioma in the airway. So approach to hemangiomas depends on the age of onset and how it progresses, whether there is ulceration, secondary infection, if there is any respiratory difficulty, especially if you, as I said earlier, in the cervicofacial or beard area, some of them can have multiple hemangiomas and can present with high output cardiac failure. Some of them can have thrombocytopenia because platelets get entrapped in these hemangiomas causing thrombocytopenia. This is called the Casabac merit phenomena. How do you manage? If they are uncomplicated, you would just leave them alone. Topical beta blockers, corticosteroids have been tried, and even uh, imiquin or mod, which is not really available in our country, has also been tried. But if you have a complicated hemangioma, hemangioma in the airway, now propranol is a drug of choice. You should start it early. You should start it by the age of by four weeks of age. You can actually start it because it works best when you have a rapidly growing hemangioma, which is in the first year of life. The dose is one to three milligram per kg. You need to give it for 18 months to two years. You need to monitor for hypoglycemia. So start with a lower dose of one per kg, gradually increase the dose, calling the patient in the OPD basis. The use of propranol for hemangiomas was discovered by accident. 
So there was a, this, there were these children in, it was a study from France where this, these kids had some cardiac abnormality and they were used, uh, giving propanolol for the cardiac uh, issues. And these kids also had hemangiomas and they found that the hemangi hemangiomas regressed. And that's how the role of propanolol came into being for hemangiomas. It's a wonder drug and it really helps in hemangiomas. Let me take you through another case. So the take home message from this case is if you have a hemangioma on the face and if you have children who may have respiratory distress, think of a hemangioma in the airway. Now this is a nine month old with croupy cough, noisy breathing and mild fever since three days. He's breathless since one day. In between the episodes of fever, he looks active and good. He has received nebulization in the ER for an audible wheeze. In past history, he has noisy breathing since one month of life, okay? And he was admitted for a bronchiolitis at the age of three months. So noisy breathing starting very early in life and audible V's. And he, uh, sometimes he has fever, otherwise he's active. On examination, he was afebrile. He had a respiratory rate of 52 per minute with intercostal, subcostal indrawing. Saturation of 84% on room air, which improved on proning. When this child was put in a prone position, his saturation improved. No cyanosis, no clubbing, no pallor expiratory stider was present and no V's was heard on auscultation. So the, in the ER, that resident doctor said, this is V's nebulized. But when we saw the child, we could not hear any uh, V's. What do you think this child has? Laringo malicia is one thought, good thought. Any other thoughts? You're right in thinking that this is some kind of a malaysia and probably not a not because this is noisy breathing. But the only thing is this child has an expiratory strider. So you have to go. This was his x-ray, which was unremarkable. ABG just showed a low PO2. Counts were normal. He was again, he was first nebulized with salbutamol, but the noisy breathing persisted. Steroids were started, did not improve. Uh, only what helped the child was proning. Okay. Uh, to some extent, the saturation kept fluctuating between 88% and 95%. In view of the expiratory strider, a bronchoscopy was done and a diagnosis of tracheobronchomalacia. So you are right in thinking of laryngomalacia, but laryngomalacia would have more of an inspiratory strider. This child had an expiratory strider. If you remember my first image, which I showed you, expiratory, think of infraglottic, going into the airways, lower down in the trachea, or the airways which would manifest with an expiratory strider. So uh, babies with the respiratory distress and noisy breathing since early childhood need to be looked into, you know, and expiratory strider with subcostal intercostal retraction, improving with proning, uh, normal x-ray, we need to consider tracheomalacia with or without a bronchomalacia. If you have a bronchomalacia, you'll have more of a wheeze. If you have tracheomalacia, you'll have more of a expiratory strider. So uh, this may, what a take home message here is that a tracheobronchiomalacia may worsen on bronchodilators because the muscles are, the, the, you know, you know, the trachea is C-shaped. You have a cartilage and you have the trachealis muscle behind. Now you give bronchodilators, which relaxes this muscle even more. It goes further here. Okay. So in these kids, the drug of choice is actually ipratropium and not salbutamol. So if you, if you relax the muscle, their malacia worsens and so does their stride. Okay, now let me take you through another case. A three month old, full term, 3.1 kg at birth, noisy breathing. Okay, no fever, cough, difficulty in feeding. So many of these times parents will come and say, my child has got cough, he's got noisy breathing. It's a very common complaint. We really need to tease out. We need to see whether it's just a nose block. Adenoid tonsils causing a stutter. So nasal, nasopharynx will cause a stutter. How do you differentiate adenoid tonsils will have a hyponasal speech. So you ask them, I do a simple test in my clinic. I ask them to say Mickey Mouse. Then I close their nose and ask them to say Mickey Mouse again. So I say Mickey Mouse, Mickey Mouse. That's the nasal speech, difference in the speech, right? If the child is anyway having a nasal speech, there is some obstruction. Commonness is an adenoid or a tonsil sitting behind, okay? So you need to tease out this noise is coming from here. Is it an inspiratory strider? Is it an expiratory strider, a biphasic strider, or a wheeze, or a snore which occurs at night? So these are all the noises of the respiratory tract. So every parent will come and say noise, but you need to understand what is the cause of the noise. 
So, so no fever, cough, or difficulty in feeding, no history of vomiting. According to the mother, the noise reduced when the child slept or was kept in the prone position. Okay, his weight was 5 kg at three months, no cyanosis, saturation of 96, some noisy breathing on inspiration, suprasternal in drawing, chest was clear, all systems were normal. Okay, so any guesses here? Three month old, noisy breathing, more on ins inspiration, suprasternal in drawing, otherwise well. Some failure to thrive. The commonest reason which we see, inspiratory stridor in a three month old. What do you see in your clinic? What you just mentioned? Yes, this is a common cause is the laryngomalacia. Okay, this is the most common thing. What is important to understand, these are the types of laryngomalacia. Okay, if you do a scopy, first here you are, these are your arytenoids which are flopping in. This is type one. Here the epiglottis is stiff and erect, omega shaped epiglottis. It doesn't just move at all. And the third one where the arytenoids are flopping in and so is the epiglottis falling on the, uh, on the airway and totally obstructing. So it's a floppy upper airway which obstructs the upper airway causing a laryngomalacia. So this is the commonest kind of inspiratory strider that you see. So floppy tissue of the voice box which drops into the airway of the child. Mind you, if you have inspiratory strider starting on day one, day two of life, think beyond laryngomalacia, okay? It could be anything else because typically we start seeing laryngomalacia around two weeks of age and beyond. We really don't see it very early, okay? And symptoms could be inspiratory stridor. There could be some difficulty in feeding. The child could choke while feeding. There could be a gastroesophageal reflux. So via reflux, these children make a lot of effort to breathe. So they go, mm, mm. when they do this, they tend to get a reflux. So these children are more prone to getting a reflux they may have poor weight gain. They could have an acute life-threatening emergency because of an aspiration, because of a complete obstruction of the respiratory tract, and they could get sinused, okay? Most of them, 90% of them would get better by 12 to 18 months of age, right? So when would you intervene? So all these run-of-the-mill, this is one of the commonest causes for an inspiratory stridor. When would you intervene in a child with laryngomalacia? when there is a significant or a progressive strider, all right? As I told you earlier, by 18 months of age, most of these kids have settled down. And by six to eight months, you see them that the strider is becoming less. But if it's progressive and significant, you would like to intervene by doing a scopy. You would, if they have apnea or cyanotic episodes, if they are failing to thrive, feeding difficulties, failing to thrive, then probably the malaria is very severe. If they have associated malformations, a congenital heart, for instance, when your diagnosis is in doubt, you would probably look into it. Or if the strider persists beyond the age of 18 months. Management for mild to moderate, you would, you would give the parent, maybe you will need to give PPIs to these children because they have a higher incidence of reflux. Some may need nothing. It's not that every mild to moderate landing of malaysia, you're going to write a PPI. No, and that's not my message to you. But if these are kids who are quite significant, who are feeding difficulties, who are arching, please go ahead and give a PPI. They may need a speech and a swallow therapy. They may, because they are failing to thrive, high calorie formulas can be given to them. And if they're moderate to severe, then you need to scope them. And some of them may require surgeries. I'm not going into the details of the surgeries. Now, this is again, a very common run of the mill case. Seven year female with sudden cough while eating. And strider, she developed a strider with severe respiratory distress. No marks for guessing this. While eating, yes. Yeah, so this was her X-ray. You see, uh, you see uh, there is an obstructive emphysema on the right side with some collapse here, and she had taken in a, a, a peanut. So you would do a flexible bronchoscopy to confirm and rigid bronchoscopy, and you probably can even remove this with a flexible bronchoscopy. So look for, if you have a history of choking, look for symptoms of strider, difficulty in breathing, wheezing, unequal signs on both sides, throat or chest pain, drooling. Think of a foreign body and accordingly, you may need to investigate and remove the foreign body. Now let's look at some little more run different cases from instead of the, I've, I've highlighted all the run of the mill cases now. So I will take you to some more uh, different kind of cases. Now this is a, a four month old male child, inspiratory strider since birth. Voice is good, but he's failing to thrive. So when you have a strider, you must also always look at the quality of voice. I told you first, you need to assess the severity of strider, go into the history, but also look at the quality of voice. 
uh, and that is very important and i'll tell you why okay so his voice quality was good he was failing to thrive and this was his video okay so look at the vocal cords now can you see that the vocal cords are barely moving and both of them are not moving right okay so this was a case of a bilateral vocal cord palsy so when you when you uh, breathe in inspiration the vocal cords have to abduct and when you expire the vocal cords adduct okay and when you speak the vocal cords adduct but there is some gap for the air to go off phonation phonation occurs uh, from the superior part of the vocal cord whereas breathing occurs from the lower part of the vocal cords okay you can have a unilateral vocal cord palsy you can have a bilateral vocal cord palsy you can have a mild palsy you can have a complete palsy if you have a mild palsy what happens to the vocal cord they for they don't abduct so abduction is gone a complete vocal cord palsy causes loss of abduction as well as adduction so you have a static vocal cord so this was a child with a bilateral vocal palsy uh, vocal cord uh, uh, palsy and as i told you you need the airways to uh, the vocal cords to be ab uh, abducted for speech with a little gap so if you have a bilateral vocal cord palsy your voice will still be good but if you have a unilateral vocal cord palsy the voice will be very breathy <sighs> and the child the child will lose his voice he'll have a weak voice because that cord will just go away side and it will be open like this now if you have a unilateral one cord goes like this your voice is gone you have a higher risk of choking and aspiration a bilateral vocal cord see for when the when the vocal cords are sitting in tight in inside like this these are kids who will have inspiratory stridor they will have respiratory distress but they will have no feeding issues because they will not aspirate and they will have a good voice so this is how you differentiate between a unilateral and a bilateral vocal cord a cord palsy clinically uh, unilateral vocal cord palsy is generally recover with time there could be there could be many reasons for it i'm not really going into the reasons for the want of time um, you need to give speech wait for 3 to 6 months most will recover speech therapy sometimes you may have to do a medialization process uh, pro procedure because these kids are maybe continuously aspirating even for a bilateral vocal cord palsy you need to wait and watch but some of them may require a tracheostomy a 5 year old male with chronic episodic cough he was being treated as asthma bronchitis as you may call it and uh, he had a biphasic stridor which became worse when he had a respiratory infection he was otherwise asymptomatic there was no failure to thrive no aspiration and his voice was good so what do you what can you make out from this history he has a biphasic stridor good voice so when you say good voice and he is not aspirating so you presume that the vocal cord function is good okay he is growing well all right but he has a biphasic so where is the stridor coming from at the level of the cords cords are little below that okay so this was the video of this child okay so watch carefully this is the epiglottis okay and now we have reached the level of the cords can you see sorry it's a little blurred can but can you see the cords moving you could see both the cords are moving completely right see and can you go beyond and when you so go beyond and see you see like a small hole normally that that's the subglottic space it should be completely open so this is a narrowed subglottic space so this was a child with subglottic stenosis biphasic uh, stridor it is at the level of the cords are just below think of a condition like a subglottic stenosis now subglottic stenosis by the mayer cotton classification can be classified from grade 1 to grade 4 grade 1 up to 50% obstruction grade 2 up to 70% grade 3 up to 9 99% and grade 4 there is no lumen at all so grade 1 and 2 often improve with time and some may, grade 3 may require some kind of a balloon dilatation which can be done but when you have a severe stenosis you will need tracheostomy for the time being and then probably a surgery to open up the uh, airway so this is how you would suspect a subglottic stenosis when you have a good voice no aspiration but a biphasic stridor now i'm going to take you through few vocal cord lesions you could have nodules you could have polyps you could have papillomas 
So symptoms of the vocal cord lesions include change in voice. We know our phonation occurs from there. So change in voice, you could have difficulty in breathing, difficulty while exercising, because if the movement of the cords is affected, your inspiration, expiration gets affected. You can have a strider, you can have, a, have associated reflux. So this is what a vocal cord nodule looks like. Many of us who sing, sing on banquets at, at, the rest, at any conference scream and shout, and that time we can land up with getting something like this, which is called the vocal cord nodules. The treatment for this is voice rest. And I think many of us doctors can also get it because you're constantly talking. Uh, um, one, I'll finish, okay? So these are nodules which are seen in the upper first third of the vocal cords. But what you see here is a polyp polyp of the vocal cords, okay? Polyp of the vocal cord may have to be removed, but the vocal cord nodule needs to be given rest. Uh, so let's look at this four-year-old. This was, he had inspiratory strider, he had a hoarse voice, which was gradually worsening. So if you're having hoarse voice strider, you, you know you're looking at something at the level of the cords, right? And this was his video. Can you see something coming off? I hope I've shown you enough videos for you to get, see, the, the pointer is pointing towards a lesion which is jutting out from the, these are their vocal cords. And this is something which is like a growth coming from there. So this was a, a polyp, a papilloma, okay? And sometimes these papillomas can obstruct the airways so much that you will need a surgical procedure, okay? I will not show you this because this is the same as papilloma. No, they are caused by the human papilloma virus 6 and 11. It can come with hoarseness, breathing uh, difficulty, chronic cough. You need a scopy to diagnose it. Currently, no cure is complete, but uh, drugs like Cidovovir are known to get good results. Uh, they have one, one has tried uh, carbon dioxide laser surgery, micro debriders, but these things keep on recur recurring. Now, this was a kid who had choking spells and strider. And this is my last video, and I will be done after this. So, this is what they're trying to show you. This is by a rigid bronchoscope, which is done by my ENT colleague. This is a laryngeal cleft. Okay, so you can see there is the gap between the interarytenoid areas. So sometimes you get laryngeal clefts and these are your grades of cleft which generally require surgical repair. You may have vascular rings which, are press, which will press, uh, press on the trachea and these are kid, kids which will come with expiratory strider because they are pressing on the trachea. They may have associated cardiac malformations and you may have to do an MR angiography, a CT to come to a conclusion. So my take home message is first, whenever you have a child with strider, please assess the child's severity of strider. See, children have small airways, less respiratory reserve, and therefore, and their metabolic needs are high. So they quickly get into decompensation and their respiratory failure causes them to have cardiac failure. So you need to first quickly assess their airway patency, degree of their respiratory effort, effectiveness of their respiratory function, and stabilize their airway. Do your ABCs before getting into why, why this child is having a strider. Then take a detailed clinical history, physical examination, think of diagnostic possibilities as I've, as I've outlined. Then uh, children with severe or persistent strider, failure to thrive, associated malformations probably need a scopy and detailed evaluation. And some of them will need radiographic studies or a direct examination of airway in selected cases. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that excellent Question. lecture, ma'am. Question, ma'am. Okay. Hello. I request very excellent Dr. presentation, dear ma'am. I request Dr. Sonali Shilpati, ma'am, to felicitate uh, Dr. Indu Khosla. And may I request Dr. Amul Murkute, sir, to felicitate Dr. Sonali Shilpati, ma'am. Thank 
I would like to. I would now like to invite the chairpersons for the next session, Dr. D. N. Balpande, sir, and Dr. Vaishali Shirshati, ma'am. A detailed history and a thorough clinical examination are the cornerstones of reaching a diagnosis in pediatric neurology. However, there are occasions when a single finding on examination can instantly clinch the diagnosis. But as the adage goes, the eyes can never see what the mind doesn't know. Is there a method to this madness? To elaborate further, I invite Dr. Anup Parma, sir, for his topic, Spotters in Neurology. Thank you very much. I would like to convey my very sincere thanks in regards to our chairperson and the organizing committee for uh, exhibiting an extraordinary uh, uh, organization of the conference right from the day one. Uh, my topic has been allotted to me by the organizing committee is the spotters in uh, pediatric neurology. And uh, I would like to say that the plan of this talk is uh, case-based interaction. You are going to see a lot of videos and photographs. Uh, clinical clues will be the total focus and brief clinical presentation and the diagnosis. Observation, observation and observation is the main crux of this lecture. And we all know that as a pediatrician, we should have a soul of uh, Sherlock Holmes, as he has said that you see, but not observe. We all see case, but as a senior, as you age grows, you try to see with observation. Senseful seeing is observation. That is very, very important. And our teacher and Amdekar sir already says that always that observation help us to see unexpected things that is very very important for we clinician who are uh, who are uh, dealing this interesting we are living in the treasure of uh, clinical cases in the opd so that is very very important and here is a video he is a patient with be a lot of behavioral arrest is there he is not aware of the surrounding quite frequent attacks is there and we know that this is a case of childhood absence, epilepsy. What you are going to do it? Hyperventilation gives a very classical signature EEG. That is the three spikes and wave is a very classical of childhood absence epilepsy. We know that this is uh, classified into typical, atypical and myoclonic and eyelid myoclonia as well. If you, if you classify this uh, epilepsy into the current classification of the ILE 2070, you can see that it is a sort of generalized nature, non-motor, typical absence. Another patient, he had a history of frequent urinary incontinence and that's why he was not attending the school. On careful observation, we find that he had history of some vacant look. He becomes unaware. Some, some sort of behavioral arrest is there. And he was kept on imipramine for obvious reason because he was urinary incontinence was there in the class and in home as well. So when we saw, we saw that he is having, having a behavioral arrest, so we could able to uh, hyperventilate this child. Now see, he is hyperventilating. Just see after hyperventilation for two to three minutes, he has passed, started passing the urine. And he is not aware. He is passing urine in my OPD. That is the CPC. Now the uh, hyperventilation induced spikes and waves. Two spikes to 2.5. Uh, myoclonic movements are there. And this was a atypical absence epilepsy. So if we classify this according to IL-8 uh, 2017, you can see it is a generalized onset, non-motor, atypical absence. Another patient who becomes unresponsive, mild jerk you are seeing, uh, especially the upper limb. See, this is my clonus and MRI epilepsy protocol normal. Interictal discharges were there. It was a generalized nature. It was a myoclonic absence epilepsy. And you uh, classify according to this uh, classification. It was a generalized onset, non-motor and myoclonic absence epilepsy. Another patient. 
repeated blinks, up rolling of up device you are seeing here, and no family history, MRI epilepsy protocol normal, EEG reviews the bust of poly spike definitely. It was sort of a myoclonic nature. This is a epilepsy with eyelid myoclonia, what we call it is G1 syndrome. If you, if you classify this, this is the generalized onset, non-motor and eyelid myoclonia. Another patient, he's in front of me in the OPD, he's not responding, he's doing some sort of automatism as well. There was a post-ictal confusion also, history of febrile seizure in the early childhood, EG reviews the temporal spikes, MRI was MTS right side, you can see the volume loss of the hippocampus. This was the MTS leading to the CPS, complex partial seizure. And if you classify it, it was a focal seizure, non-motor, behavioral arrest was there. Another patient. Just listen the conversation. He is having an impaired awareness. He is sitting in front of me. He is not responding. Responding command persisting for more than two minutes. His spike was there in the EG. If, if MRI was normal. This was a temporal lobe epilepsy leading to CPS. And if you classify it, it was a focal sort of thing, impaired awareness and behavioral arrest. Hey, hey. This was a patient who was who was who become unaware of the surrounding quite frequently. Hey. But, but it was only in the Never daytime, way. not in the night. Hey. And it has a very psychological stressor was there because he was he belongs to a remote village of uh, Uttar Pradesh. He was brought to in some madrasa. He was very, very afraid of the teachers as well there. And this was a classical history of EG was absolutely normal. You are seeing the EG. This is normal, MRI normal. This was a daydreaming. So this is all, everything was normal. He sleeps very well but all the things were in the daytime already. So it was a presence of psychological stressor. A child may stare, but does not have a distinct change in the facial. And he used to have made aware by pinching the nose, then he suddenly comes. So these were the collage of all behavioral arrest you are seeing. We have seen the list of the behavioral arrest. Uh, you just, this is the collage of this. Another patient. So what is this? What type of speech is this? Nasal speech is this. So this is a hypernasal speech or rhinolalia. This was a patient who had nasal speech, regurgitation of fluid from the nose and non-progressive painless in nature. Let's see, what, what you have noted? You have noted that the palate is shifted to the left side. So there is a right-sided, uh, so there is a deviation of the uvula to, to the left, suggesting weakness of the right side of the soft palate. So this is the right-sided palatal palsy. So after treating, you can see after seven days, you, by oral methyl prednisolone, you can see and follow up of seven, 14 and three days, child recovered very well. So <clears throat> it can be due to trauma, it can be due to infections, it can be due to vascular origin. And we know that palate is supplied by the pharyngeal branch of the vagus nerve. So this is another case, uh, all from day of presentation to the uh, recovery. Another patient, just listen. Now, again, you are listening the nasal speech. Now see another video. He is drinking water and he's regurgitating from the nose. So this is a nasal regurgitation and rhinonalia as well. And you can see examination of the throat reveals the presence of white patch. KLB was positive. So diphtheria can give rise to nasal quality and nasal regurgitation as well. So diphtheria is not rare. Always, always in your OPD, try to emphasize routine immunization, which is very, very important. Another patient with rash, headache and vomiting, semi-conscious, irritable. Another diagnosis is almost clear that this is a varicella rash 
and this is a classical varicella encephalitis by just examination you you, you just cannot uh, diagnose that this is only varicella encephalitis but there are clinical clues so you have to do the csf pcr for varicella zoster for ruling out the varicella encephalitis another patient who is delayed in motor milestone excessive cry is there uh, the the micro kefali gray hairs hair was very classical and attractive our attention and the distinct faces you are seeing the chubby rosy sagging cheeks uh, digital depressed nose large ears were there and this is the hairs which is very very classical don't effort to miss this type of hair which is very brittle and kinky in nature sparse coarse twisted was there so any guess any guess kinky hair it is a mankey's syndrome and you are seeing the mr angiography revealing the toxicity of the cerebral blood vessel serum copper and serous seroplasmin you are seeing here and this we have reported in the indian pediatrics manky kinky hair disease another patient who is who is 4 years but appears to be a bodybuilder see the stance and see the way he is standing any clue for muscular build or delayed motor milestone see the tsh was quite high and there is no epiphysis in the so it is a classical hypothyroid a uh, myopathy or myopathy of the hypothyroidism or cocker debe sembling syndrome another patient who is very very hypotonic absolutely hypotonia is there generalized weakness is there the he had a history of uh, one child expired at the age of 2 and 1/2 months so always examine this child because the facial expression is not absolutely good alert look that is very important so this is a alert look with severe hypotonia with a history of a child died in the family gives you a clinical clue that you may be dealing with the spinal muscular atrophy and these are the clinical clues number one video is alert look loss of anti gravity traction response is poor you are seeing horizontal suspension you are seeing the uh, they are always at the verge of hypoxia so this may be a terminal event this is a very difficult to treat disease that is very very important these are the spectrum of floppy ch children in indian scenario so you can see the type of sma sma1 sma2 sma3 like that another child who has a difficulty in uh, climbing the stairs you are seeing that there is a proximal muscle weakness is there what is this gate is this is a gate is trandelenburg gate or penguin gate you have seen the penguin moving this is due to the proximal muscle weakness of the thighs to the legs you are seeing now the you can see that this is a exhibition of the goer sign now it is very clear in our mind that we are dealing with a proximal muscle weakness goer positive and this is maybe a duchenne muscular dystrophy and you can see the calf muscle hypertrophy is also there uh this is basically due to the infiltration of the fat these are the various other causes of the calf muscle hypertrophy bmd <coughs> bakers and <coughs> hypothyroid like that goers have a two sort of component the first component you are seeing is the child is getting into prone position from the and forms a triangle this is a part one and this is another sort of thing he climbs in his thighs to stand up that is the goer sign and we know that goer signs are positive in all conditions where proximal muscle weakness is there maybe a dmd maybe sarcoglycopathy maybe sma2 and sma3 another patient gait instability you are seeing in the video is not able to stand broad based gaze there very cela rash was there in this child so everybody can now say that you are seeing a case of ataxia due to varicella infection acute cerebellitis due to varicella and this is the mri you are seeing bilateral cerebellitis is here thank you very thank you dear so this is <clears throat> common a patient is having common neurological complication of varicella seen in children younger than 
15 years, spontaneous recovery is known. Now, this is a patient who is having sudden explosive ataxia. He had a history of three, four uh, days of viral fever was there, examination was normal. So you can say that this acute cerebellar ataxia usually appears after a sort of viral illness, three to four days. And this is a diagnosis by exclusion. You have to rule out other causes of ataxia, then come to diagnosis. So it is an explosive ataxia preceded by viral infection. <clears throat> Another case of acute cerebellar ataxia. These are the various causes of the ataxia as viral, mostly viral, bacterial cadmium, legionella and mycoplasma as well. Here is again a patient, just see the, he is now attempting to walk and just see the walk. This is a gait ataxia and this was noted from the age of two, two and a half years. History of recurrent, recurrent URI and ARI was there. And upon examination of the eyes, that is very, very important. Don't afford to miss the eyes in any case of ataxia. You will otherwise lose the diagnosis. And you can see that tortuous conjunctival vessel, acanthocytes were in the peripheral smear, IgA level reduced, AFP was elevated, ataxia, telangiectasia. Another patient have, some patient have a very subtle sign. You can see that he's just, just see the gate of the cell. He's entering in my chamber. You just see this, just his slight lurch is there, but it has a focal uh, pyramidal extensor lesion. You can see the para, uh, extensor uh, planter was there. Focal seizure, recurrent headache was there and see the, the, the huge glioma sitting here. So see the extensor with planter. So small things may give you a good clues for the diagnosis. Another patient we have seen five days early only. He had a weakness and gait disturbance. You are seeing he had a vomiting, just sudden sort of right upper limb and large open, uh, lurching was there. Deep tendon reflexes were positive. Plantar extension, speech delay and had size circumference one more. And see the uh, a huge, uh, glioma was there and it is very difficult to convince the patient when they come just a history of uh, uh, say uh, 15 to 20 days and the child is moving slight lurch is there so uh, there is a, uh, you can see the glioma extending from the right front to parietal region so medicine is a science of uncertainty an art of probability that we have to understand and accordingly we have to counsel this patient uh, these are the several videos which are indicative of a particular lesion in the brain tandem walking edado cocainesia positive you can see the heel to toe test this is a classical cerebellar sign the patient is exhibiting and you can see the mri you can see the posterior fossa so the cerebellum uh, and the vermis involving the huge medulloblastoma giving so gray matters every day so that is very important another patient uh, having the weakness and the gait instability and you can see the uh, DTR, there was a reflexia is there, Romberg sign positive, and see the ataxia. He is swaying on the right side. The, you can see the deep tendon jerks were absent, but the planters were extensor. So the MRI normal, NCV normal, ECO was revealing uh, dilated cardiomyopathy. Blood sugar was quite high, and the mutation of MX and FX and gene in chromosome. This is a case of uh, Frederick's ataxia. Another patient having a seasonal variation. There is a lot of rush in a particular season that a patient enters in your chamber with a very painful gait, and the parents are accompanying this. He simply had a history of viral fever three to four days. That's all. So, what is this? Yes. This is a very, very classical presentation and this is a very broad with the anxious parent. It's so painful condition. So this is very important. And just you have to do this CPK, which is going to give you sky high, more than 500 to 1000 as well. So this is a classical benign acute childhood myositis. So correct diagnosis is three-fourth the remedy someone has rightly said. 
if you know that this is a bscm no need to do otherwise admission investigation is so it is very very important another patient we are seeing the is exhibiting a particular sign is not able to stand with feet closed malaise ataxia mild leg stress was there glossitis deep tendon jerks were absent uh, plantar wear flexor loss of vibration sense positive rhombus was there you can see the yeah, see the not not able to do the uh, this an mcv 107 macrocytosis hypersegmented neutrophils sensory neuropathy was there vitamin b level is quite low so it is a vitamin b level b deficiency peripheral neuritis or you can say subacute combined degeneration of the cord and see the after supplementation the the young man is moving like anything this is again a patient presented with a lot of uh, uh, brown spots and says everybody uh, will say that, yes, maybe we are dealing with a case of neurofibromatosis uh, type 1. Uh, mother is also having uh, similar spots, the present uh, having a large head, ADSD. No other feature suggestive of NF1. We know that there are uh, set criteria for diagnosis of NF1. So there is no other feature except for this. So this is a classical thing which very closely mimic with the NF1 is the Legius syndrome. So we should not afford to straight away make the diagnosis of NF1 because we have various other features of the NF1. This is a Legius syndrome where the mutation in the spread one gene. These are the criteria of the NF1. You have six or more capulet patch, uh, neurofibroma, two or more, frecklings, optic glioma, leash nodules, uh, sphenoid dysplasia, and first degree relatives. So this is the classical criteria. Here is another patient. See the classical caffeulate patches is there, but it should be more than uh, six in numbers. So this, is, this is just examine the eyes. See, just close up of the eye. Leash nodules are present in this slide. So this is and the family history. So younger brother is also having the similar sort of spots in the body. So and if <clears throat> this uh, MRI reveals the uh, areas of signal intensities as well. Another patient, very important. How many clues you can pick up from this? You are seeing half of the body is atrophied. Left face, you are seeing, left chest, you are seeing as well. So there is a progressive hemifacial atrophy, which was noted from the 9 to 10 years of age. Now see the, he is protruding the tongue. You can see there is a deviation of the mouth and nose on the affected side. You can see the atrophy of the half of the tongue is there. Mandible is also atrophied. So this is a classical case of... He had a focal seizure on the opposite side. This is a perirhombus disease. See the half of the, this is a perirhombus syndrome. And there is a demarcation line between the normal and the abnormal. This is a copedi cyber sign of perirhombus disease. You can see the perirhombus syndrome is a progressive hemifacial atrophy, midline groove. Jacontralectral Jacksonian epilepsis can be there. Another patient with set of clinical clues, set of clinical clues. We have seen atrophy. Now we are seeing the unilateral hypertrophy. You are seeing the right half of the face is atrophied. Right palm is at, uh, hypertrophied. You are seeing the uh, nevus is all, uh, always, the, you see the macrodactyly, lengthening of the right lower limb, large foot. This is, we are following this patient since last four years. You can see the, how the plantar lesion changes with age. You can see, this is the classical of Proteus syndrome, hypertrophic Proteus. Progression, this is known as the Mokashin lesion. And you can see that this uh, having a cribri from mixed connective tissue, it is similar to the sulci and gyri of the brain. Is it just mimicking the same? This is the Mokashin lesion of the soul. So massive, asymmetrical overgrowth, craniofacial dysmorphism, epidermal nevus, and they are sporadic in nature. These are the hemi-hypertrophy syndromes. So friends, world, we should always remember the words of wisdom by Sir William Mosler. What he has said, the, the 
that to study the phenomena of disease without book is to sail in uncharted sea but to study the patient without books those to study the books without patient is not to go to sea at all what our brain knows we try to explore in our patient so instead of seeing the patient let us try to observe the patient senseful seeing and medicine is learned by bedside and not in the classroom a picture is worth a thousand words and i cannot define a mokashin lesion i cannot define a peepaldism unless i have seen once thank you so much thank you dr anup verma bye you you have definitely view the theme of this uh, this conference that is you have used the magic by logic and neurology so neurology is a super specialty subjects for our pediatricians and you have definitely presented nicely the presentation was so with the pictures and other things most of the things you have made it clear to the all these audience thank you very much thank Once you thank you so much sir i request dr balpande sir to felicitate dr anup verma sir and may i ask dr tarun kanade sir to felicitate our joy persons मागे थैंक यू सो मच डॉक्टर अनुप वर्मा सर डॉक्टर बालपांडे सर एंड मैडम इट वॉज डेफिनेटली अ वेरी गुड लर्निंग कर्व फॉर ऑल ऑफ अस फॉर न्यूरोलॉजी केसेस आई हैव नॉट सीन अ सिंगल प्रोटीएस सिंड्रोम एंड बाय सींग यूर स्लाइड्स आई आई हैव आई हैव गॉट सम ऑफ द आई हैव आई हैव स्टोलन सम ऑफ यूर स्लाइड्स थैंक यू सो मच uh moving on to the next session we don't have much time uh, i'll uh, invite our next moderator dr tarun kanade sir to grace the stage he's already here our next speakers dr sonu udani ma'am uh, uh dr vinay joshi sir dr abhijit bagre sir dr minaj sheik madam to kindly minaj <laughs> minaj sheik sir sorry to kindly grace the stage our next topic is inotropes chasing the number i thought we have done with adrenaline and noradrenaline yesterday but then dr tarun kanade came rushing to us that all is not over yeah. inotropes in intensive care is as important as laryngoscope and ventilators inotropes do not only help in reviving patient in circulatory shock but also to make him stay put and maintain a proper heart rate and blood pressure but the whole thing is not as simple as it seems gone are the days when we used to jab a needle through the precordium straight into the dying heart we now precage and predict the mishap in the making and initiate therapy before it is too late which inotrope how much how fast or how slow and how long cannot be decided by us bread and butter pediatrician unless we acquire the expertise like my friends sitting over here i request dr tarun kanade to conduct the session and plead to the esteemed panelists to be precise and brief to enable dr tarun to finish his session in stipulated time over to you dr kanade thank you 
गुड मॉर्निंग फ्रेंड्स आई डाउट सेट इट्स अ चिली मॉर्निंग टुडे फॉर अ चेंज इट्स अ वेरी द स्टेज इज क्वाइट हैवी टुडे नॉट ओनली बिकॉज ऑफ मी but because of the experience these people on the stage have all of them have been my teachers they are still teaching me and i think so the biggest teachers of for all of us are our patients and as dr sheetal rightly pointed out <clears throat> what inotope to choose when to use when to escalate when to deescalate these questions have been troubling us for time immemorial and i don't think so we still have the answers to that most of them but we'll still try to explore whatever evidence we have it will be a case based approach and uh, i would shortly i would uh, 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 sh give a short introduction about my panelist dr sunudani ma'am she is a pediatric intensivist uh, our teacher and she does cl classify all the features of a mother so uh, uh, she is the head of pediatric department and direct medical director at srcc uh, uh, hospital for children managed by narayana health at haji ali mumbai dr vinay doshi who's been a teacher uh, to me and because of whom i could go through my exams of which the examiner was madam so uh, he is a pediatric and neonatal intensivist at cloud 9 hospital mumbai dr mina sheikh sir he is knowing me since my md days he is a senior pediatric intensivist and consultant pediatrician at lilavati hospital mumbai dr abhijit bagde uh, i am sorry to say he discussed to me before entering into pediatric critical care and uh, i'm sorry if you are not happy but <laughs> that's the way life is <laughs> he's my good friend uh, and a nashikite at heart uh, i welcome him he is a pediatric intensivist at apollo hospitals navi mumbai so uh, enough of flattery now let's start uh, our main job so uh, uh, basic indication for inotropes is shock so what is shock shock is basically end organ poor perfusion there is a compensated phase of shock in which the body tries to maintain normalcy as much as possible whatever reserves it has the amount of reserves differs according to age group according to the stature of the child the structure of the child's body after a phase of compensated shock there is a uncompensated state of shock in which it's like a domino effect the process is difficult to stop and which ends in cell death our job is to pick up this end organ poor perfusion act in the compensated phase of shock and prevent the child going to uncompensated phase of shock by using whatever modalities we have with us so this was these are our targets so this was the early gold dated therapy which has been there since last 20 25 years and these were the targets given to us when we were learning critical care this chart in a broad sense has remained the same however there have been many changes over a period so we need to give fluids how much and how when to give that has been changing we need to start on catecholamines how much and which to give it has been changing so we'll just go through that shortly so the vital skill in intensive care is to take a decision and what decision to take when to take should we fill in air or should we squeeze the heart that is what is the crux over here we basically follow in critical care as well as in pediatrics we follow this algorithm we identify the deficiency what is deficient in this patient is it fluid which is deficient is the heart falling short what is happening is the afterload high accordingly we take a corrective action we monitor the response to this corrective action and then we again see whether deficiency has been corrected or not so this is a ongoing process it never stops it only stops when the patient either goes to his home or to god's home so that is what is our job as a pediatrician is to keep on monitoring what is the response to our therapy so let's start with our case first so this was a uh, this is a month back this is eight old eight month old uh, male child who was referred from peripheral hospital with fever for 3 days uh, the child was has been afebrile for last 12 hours the child had vomiting at onset which is non bilious non projectile the child has has abdominal distension since a day there has been a decreased urine output since last 12 hours and that is the prime reason why the child was sent to us and the child has been drowsy since last one day has not been accepting, accepting feeds very well the child was drowsy but arousable there was tachycardia tachypnea the blood pressure for his age was preserved but the child had poor peripheral pulses the crt was prolonged and the uh, child had cold peripheries 
the child had edema, facial puffiness, errantry was decreased in both bases. There was tender hepatomegaly and there was fluid in the abdomen. CBC was suggested of leukopenia, thrombocytopenia. There was hemoconcentration, hemoglobin of, uh, of 13 with a hematocrit of 42 and a dengue NS1 was positive. The child had high liver enzymes on admission. So this is our what case we see routinely. Earlier we used to see in monsoons, now we see in post-monsoon. So demography has been changing a lot. Uh, <clears throat> so this baby, as we if we take the primary assessment triangle, the pediatric assessment triangle, the child had tachypnea, the child uh, not very alert, and the circulation was compromised. So the impression was dengue shock. We started on IV fluid bolus, 10 ml per kg. The, the child required two boluses. There was slight improvement in peripheries, but the shock was still persistent, and there was no urine still. So Dr. Meena sir, I would like to ask you, would you like to catheterize this child? And if we catheterize, what should be our target urine output? Well, uh, at the outset, yes, this child is in uh, shock, yes. dengue fever, and we need what is called as targeted fluid therapy. So since we need targeted fluid therapy, we need to catheterize this child for two reasons. One is shock, second is targeted. And the targeted urine output desirable is as a 0.8 to 1 ml per kg per hour. Based on that, we will target our fluid therapy as the shock dynamics changes here. Correct. Right? correct. So correct. I would straight forward go for the yeah. Uh, Nowadays, even 0.5 ml per kg per hour is acceptable, but there should be some urine. The child should not be aneuric for a long time. Uh, Dr. Abhijit, would you like to go do something else before going to inotropes, or is inotrope the final answer? So uh, at this point of time, before going for inotropes, a couple of things which we need to address is have we given adequate fluids? Correct. Though dengue is not septic shock, we don't keep on giving 10 ml per kg multi multiple boluses, but we have to go slow and as rightly said, goal-directed fluid therapy. Uh, UAG assessment with IVC, it's a separate topic, but yes, it helps to see what is the fluid status. And as of date, I would also consider if your IVC is full, maybe your early colloid, albumin is a good choice nowadays, but not immediately, maybe after 10 ml per kg. And lastly, I think we have seen lots of HLH as of in last two, three months. Yeah. So I'll keep it in my mind at this Back point. of the mind, yeah. So uh, point well taken, Abhijit. We have to, it's a slow sustained fluid delivery. It should not be like give boluses. So you give fluids, but over a period. And keep on going till the time you are really sure that the child has improved perfusion and the urine output is improving and there is end organ perfusion is improving. Dr. Vinay said, at what level do you think we should start inotopes? What is What numbers are we looking at? See, the uh, initial philosophy was, you know, you give fluid, fluid, fluid. And Correct. when you start seeing the uh, signs of fluid overload, then you add inotropes. inotropes. I think that's a stale idea. Now, I think you shouldn't be going by that. Once you give one fluid bolus. I think rather I will say that if I anticipate that this patient is going to require more fluid and he's not going to respond to uh, just a fluid bolus, I will start thinking about my inotrope with my first bolus itself. Correct. Okay, so once my so first bolus is going in, uh, I would prepare for inotrope. I now that choosing the inotrope is a different story. How yeah, about yeah. you choose? But I think you st should start thinking about inotropes with your first bolus itself. There is no harm. If you don't, if you don't require it, there's a different Correct. thing. Absolutely. But I think you're, what sir is trying to say is very uh, bang on. You start thinking of, I know, say a good intensivist is one who anticipates things. So when you start giving your first fluid bolus, that time only think, so this child three days history, deteriorated very fast, hematocrit 42 for an infant, drowsy, not no urine since 12 hours. So you think that this is probably already having, we are still in the uncompensated, but this child might, this is in a compensated state, but child might go into uncompensated any time. So you start thinking that this child might require anotropes very early on. And you see, the, some of the clinical signs take time to improve, like yeah. urine output. It's Correct. not going to happen. You give fluid bolus, your urine Absolutely. output improves, right? Yeah. yeah. So I think so that we have to anticipate and think about anotropes. Sir. Correct. Now the main question, ma'am, which anotrope would you go for? I've seen the following slides, but I would definitely in our unit, and I think currently, generally in most places, norepinephrine. it's norepinephrine. Yeah. You see the PP, even though you have a narrow pulse pressure, a, a very cold, White. clammy child, yeah. the pulse pressure is not very narrow. Correct. Now we know from various studies by Suchitra, Juma, and even from um, studies all over that you have a mixed picture. 
Correct. It's not cold shock, warm, warm shock. shock. All those concepts have to use uh, Vinay's word become stale. We know that there will be a mixed picture. There will be some uh, bodies that will have cold, some organs that and uh, uh, areas that will be in cold perfusion and some which will be in a uh, hyperperfused state or in a wide pulse pressure state. Now, why do we worry about this wide pulse pressure? Because it is linked to perfusion. And as you very clearly said earlier, it's uh, perfusion that we are targeting. So we need to narrow the pulse pressure down, raise the mean arterial pressure. Correct. Very and important. for that, I would choose not. Yeah, so that is why this question was directed to Madam. Though we all know what we have done, and most of you will do the same thing, but this is the one which I really want to harp upon, is that you need to start some vasoconstrictor. You see the blood pressure, it was a wide pulse, pulse pressure. So there, we need to increase the afterload and see the, how the heart behaves. If the heart is able to improve its output just by raising afterload, the end organ perfusion will improve significantly. What we would do, what you and I would do is start dobutamine. That is what is our, have been, is in what we have been doing. So, but this is a new concept that you need to see how the heart behaves. You need to target the perfusion of the organ rather than the numbers. So this is what uh, is very well taken, ma'am. Very ex excellently explained as always. So obviously this child was started on dobutamine because uh, this is what we have been learning since long time. You start dobutamine at 10 mics. The child was catheterized, though the parents registered, but still we catheterized the child because it was as essential as intubating the child. We targeted uh, the child had a urine output of 0.5 ml per kg per hour. The child, as Abhijit said, we, give, we were giving some extra fluid, just 5 ml per kg. Uh, but the child had a significant edema which was increasing because there was a leak which was going on. The blood pressure was maintained, still not going into uncompensated, but the child remained drowsy. So are we okay, Dr. Vinay sir? Is it okay? The child is having urine output 0.5, but the child remained drowsy. Are we, have we achieved our targets? No, definitely not. Your blood pressure is maintained, but other organs are still ill perfused. And you are asking, optimizing dobutamine? No. I think I would add, basically, I would not use a dobutamine in this case. Correct. Uh, correct. Not at all. Uh, optimizing, maybe I can, if I started not adding, I can go up on the dose a little bit. I can do that. See, but before I add another inotrope, I would get the 2D coda. Correct. That's correct. the normal. I, I won't add second inotrope without looking at the heart and looking looking at the volume yeah. status. Colloid, yes. So if I given enough fluid, and as you see that, you know, extra fluid at 5 ml per kilo when we're given increasing edema. Yeah. I think there is a lot of... Correct. Uh, correct. So it's not helping us. The fluid is just getting leaked us. out. And the edema is going on in yeah. So rather I will, here I can use albumin. Yes. 5% you know, albumin instead of, you know, uh, crystalloid. So that, that will help. Okay. Furosemide infusion, I think. Yeah, I Abhijit, what about la Lasix? Would you go for Lasix over here? Yeah, but not at this point of time. Let the shock mm -hmm. and hemodynamics settle a bit. Absolutely. First, uh, let there be improvement in the heart rate, blood pressure, perfusion, CNS. And again, what we are not targeting is only numbers but improvement in the end organ perfusion. Correct, correct. And by and large, the urine output also picks up spontaneous diuretic starch, but you can start a low dose plastic infusion rather than bolus doses. Correct. So like everyone has said, dobutamine, mildrenone are support inotropes or vasopressors or whatever you want to call them. They're not vasopressors. So usually, except in a very pure cardiac right ventricular dysfunction, you would use these as a support and not as a loan. So be very careful when you do use dobutamine. You can have a child whose BP drops very rapidly if you use dobutamine in a situation correct, like this. Correct, correct. So uh, careful when careful. you use dobutamine and milrinol. So there is no magic drug in dengue. It's a dynamic process as, as each shock is. So here what we are trying to say is uh, dengue shock, I dobit suru karun so that is not what we are learning. We have to keep, see what is the physiology, see the BP. And once you start any inotrope, see the response. And Dobitin, the child has not responded to Dobitin, which is the optimal dose is 10 mics. Actually, the time, 10 mics, the child should have responded if it would have a cardiogenic element purely. Like Madam said, this is a mixed picture. So maybe our choice of inotrope was not right. We should have really gone for NORAD and then maybe stepped up NORAD a little bit before thinking about Dobitin, unless we have, a, as Dr. Vinay said, we should have some evidence of cardiac dysfunction. So eco is best. I know we all are from a resource limited setting. Getting an eco done is like something from heaven. So uh, at this state, it is little difficult at most peripheries. People 
people who are managing these patients, they don't have access to eco. Even Nasik people have little difficulty in getting an eco done. It, very few places have bedside echoes. So shifting the patient to another to a place where the eco is done, echoes are done, but getting that patient there itself is a big task. So echoes are little bit still out of reach for us. See, you don't need uh, a very detailed echocardiography yeah. here. So I see I I don't the machine do, is out of I, reach. I, I don't do the structural heart defect. But you know, if you put a probe on the heart, you know at least the contactility, whether the heart is full with blood or it is, you know, there is uh, still hypovolemic, the, the, uh, the, the chambers are collapsed. So in that, that gives you a little bit of idea Correct. How, how the heart is functioning. So that helps you to choose at least, you know, whether you go for inotropes or whether you go for a vasopressor. There's no rhythm abnormality. ECG so probably... will never help you in this. You'll see a sinus tachycardia. It, no, it will not help you. Unless it's a very terminal thing. And it's an electrolyte abnormality mm. or something. ECG is not going to be helpful. And like Vinay said, uh, today, the, our junior most residents are picking up the probe and, you know, are putting it on yeah. everybody. So it's not actually a very difficult uh, subject to learn. And uh, the machines, I know, are very expensive, but it's very, very useful. It's like a second stethoscope. Almost before we even auscultate, you know, we can diagnose fluid, we can diagnose pneumonia, collapse, so many things just by using an ultrasound machine. So, message for us is before investing into something else, invest in an eco machine. It will really help you. It will help you in managing fluids, it'll help you in diagnosing the correct answer and obviously getting the correct answers and managing it appropriately. Fortunately, God's grace, this patient improved. We stepped up dobutamine. And uh, obviously, the child was going into a resorptive phase, but we give a low dose uh, elastic infusion over 12 hours. Things improved and the patient went home uh, well. So let's come to the next case. This is a four-year-old girl who was around 15 days back was admitted with us, was referred to us for 30% scars due to hot milk over the abdomen. The child was admitted with hypovolemic shock, received fluids, but and responded that time. The fluid, uh, the urinopter was maintained 1 to 1.5 ml per kg per hour. Surgical dressings were done twice, but started on oral feeds. Apparently, the child was doing well, but then this, she started spiking three days on, on day three onwards. So this is how the classical burns behaves. Initially, they are very good, and the real fun starts after three to four days. The tachycardia worsened, perfusion deteriorated, blood pressure started dropping, urine output was low, count showed low counts, uh, neutropenia, platelets, so one lakh, hemoglobin is 8.9. CRP was very high, 96. Procal was 2.4. Antibiotics were stepped up to meropenem, vancomycin. Blood cultures were sent. Respiratory status was worsening. Increased work of breathing was there, though the chest was not showing any uh, decreased air entry, but the work of breathing was increasing. The child was intubated electively, ventilated with pressure control, did not require very high pressures to maintain good tidal volumes. So, coming down to the, again the decision making, Abhijit, do you think the child requires more fluids? Burns the fluid to the night, right? See, this child is already edematous, but that is also part and parcel of the burns and the leak which would have happened in the last couple of days. Secondly, the albumin is also 1.6. So directly before going into the inotropes of vasoactive agent, I would certainly try with 10 ml per kg of fluid and see what is the response. This is we are entering into septic shock. Yeah. Should be treated as septic shock. Correct. Start with 10 ml per kg, see the response, maybe another 10. And considering the albumin, which is so low, I would also consider after 3 ml, 30 ml per kg uh, albumin infusion as a uh, over a period of time. Correct. Absolutely. Very well taken. That the child, we should give fluid definitely first, but not very high fluids considering the pathophysiology of burns and sepsis. Start with 10 ml, maybe another 10 ml, but keep in mind that child will require probably albumin. So that is what we need to be uh, anticipating. Madam, again, the same question. Uh, difficult question to answer, but is this baby in warm shock or cold shock, especially in setting without an echo? Can I just see the previous slide? So you do have a blood pressure that is tachycardic, 90 by 56, doesn't really tell you anything, doesn't even tell you much about compensation or non-compensation, but there is a bit of a widening pulse pressure, definitely not a very narrow pulse pressure. Now, um, again, I would always say this is mixed shock. There will be uh, uh, vasodilated beds and there will be vasoconstricted beds. And here again, I go the same way. 
Uh, I would again think about more of a vasodilatory early septic shock. Also, there is a very low colloid, so filling the patient first would be my first priority. Uh, one of the two cardinal mistakes we make in burns is we don't give them enough protein. And the way to give them protein right from day one after the resuscitation is to feed them enterally. And this can prevent the hypoalbuminemia and uh, the deterioration that sets in after three to four days, which is very, very common. Thank you, ma'am. So uh, again, over here, probably this is a, a vasodilatory shock. We need a vasoconstrictor agent. So probably we'll start thinking about norepinephrine again over here. Dr. Binay, again, the same question. Should we go for an inotrope or should we go for a vasopressor? I think the vasopressor would vasopressor be Vasopressor is the answer, yes. See, if you look at the vasopressor, which one, which are, which one are available? I'm not going to use vasopressin here. Yeah. Uh, my choice would be noradrenaline. So noradrenaline has got inotropic effect. So they are not purely vasoconstrictor. Correct, correct. They have got inotropic effect. If your cardiac function, you're saying there is no echo. But yeah. if you have echo and if you find that there is a cardiac function uh, compromise, then I will add noradrenaline plus adrenaline also. It correct, will help. Correct, correct. So I will try to add according to that. So I think you cannot be hard and fast. I will use pure vasoconstrictors or pure inotropes. So what about dopamine? So it has a vasoconstrictor effect. It has some inotropy. So do you think it's right in our settings right now? See, dopamine causes a lot of tachycardia. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Even the, the dopamine for that matter. Correct, so I think you need correct. to be very careful. I won't use yeah. adrenaline for that reason. Rather, mm. I will go for noradrenaline. So correct. Remember the first choice. Very important point, sir, made over here that dopamine, dobutamine, adrenaline all cause a lot of chronotropy. Chronotropy means they increase the heart rate. Increasing heart rate increases the myocardial consumption. And it is in a, in a state where you are already in shock, you already your end organ perfusion is compromised. The heart is also an organ, so it is also compromised. So in that, if you are increasing the oxygen demand, the heart suffers. And in, in, uh, uh, in order to uh, provide oxygen and delivery to the tissues, the heart suffers and that's, it, it happens sim similar to like how a mother, a mother want, sacrifices herself to provide for her children, but in the end, the mother gets tired. So the heart will get tired and cause more problems to you. Norepinephrine does not markedly increase oxygen demand or oxygen consumption. So it's a safe bet. People are very afraid of noradrenaline. That is the basic, uh, Dr. Minasa will be uh, knowing it. Norepinephrine bullet, the people go on, first of all, they think, why noradrenaline? There are Norepinephrine comes down the list. So, um, but believe me, it in low doses, if you titrate it properly, it can be given. Dr. Minasar, what do you think? Uh, uh, should we start noradrenaline from a peripheral line? Yeah, uh, before I go for the like debate of noradrenaline, if you go to adult ICU, yeah. nurse know only one to begin with, norad. Yeah. So adults are very clear and we extrapolate from them over a period of time. But sir, peripheral of course, line. of course, I'm coming to that. Yeah. Of course, uh, we have to titrate based on the scenario. Coming to central versus peripheral. Yes, sir. Need of the time is important. Yes, sir. If you have peripheral, don't wait for central. Absolutely. You can rightly, safely start from the peripheral line with a caveat that we have to optimally dilute it. Average is five times more dilution from the central. So if you have a, like, you know, one concentration, you have to make it five times concentration. Safely given from the periphery. However, don't sit on peripheral line. Try to get central line as early as possible because this child is burn, septic shock, intubated, mechanically ventilated, needs sedation, analgesia, inotropes. We will be reading the lines. Absolutely. The lines are required. We can so you anticipate, fortunately, this child, we anticipate this might deteriorate. So on day one itself, during the first dressing itself, we put in an IJ because all other sites were burnt. So, uh, but point well taken, sir, uh, Sheikh, sir, very important thing. We can give not into peripheral line till a central axis is available. A good way to access a large vein, though it's still a peripheral vein, is external jugular vein. Uh, it does not require a great amount of skill, only requires a good amount, a good nursing and a good person who gives you a good position. Okay. So, uh, uh, external jugular vein can be used as a substitute till you get a central line. Okay. So, please uh, don't get, be afraid of noradrenaline. You see how adult people are behaving. They start norad, the sister itself starts. And pediatric. Absolutely. There shouldn't be, it shouldn't be a hurry, but you need it. See, see, you have to balance the benefits and the risks. Doctor, it is, it is, you know, you have to titrate the clinical scenario. Nothing is, I mean, you have to go as per the clinical need. I mean, there's nothing in a hurry and nothing in a date. 
it's based on the time which is required at that point. So this this child was started on dopamine at 10 mics. The shock didn't improve, rather worsened. The peripheries became cold. Tachycardia went on increasing. The blood pressure was maintained, but there was a falling urine output. So, ma'am, uh, Vinesha, do you think there's still any role of dopamine in our ICUs right now? Yeah. Yeah. We have moved away from dopamine yeah. for the uh, last few last years. years. See, dopa what should under dopamine has got uh, apart from uh, inotropy and vasopressor effect, there are other side effects yes, which sir. can be counterproductive. You know, like yes, uh, uh, dopamine is known to increase the pulmonary vascular resistance, which yes. you definitely don't want in any case. Absolutely. Dopamine has got uh, the effect on uh, thyroid function. Yes. You know, it, uh, uh, negative effect on that so correct, again correct. that is not a good idea yeah i think we the, so looking... as a whole dopamine has a lot of detrimental effects on other organs rather than just and even on the heart it is not a, such a favor even i i don't remember I, I, ever i have used dopamine since coming to nasik so i don't remember when i've used dopamine but dopamine is not a very good drug though if you're in the periphery now you don't have access to a central line you don't have access to a person who's doing echo you don't have access to a person who's monitoring okay you want to refer the child Start the child on dopamine at 10 and maybe refer to a higher center where things are available and child can be managed in a better way. Yes, Abhi, that, that's what would you advise to a person who is referring to you from a periphery? Since you handle a lot of cases from Konkan and Panvel and Mahad. So certainly, as rightly pointed by everyone, we shouldn't wait for starting inotropes. One. Number two, it can be very well started from a peripheral line. And third, timely referral is very crucial. I think three important messages, timely referral. Yes, thank you, Amijit. Now, this VBG showed a very high lactate. The mixed uh, venous oxygen saturation is 57%. So, should we give more fluids, Abhijit? I think till now, we have ventilated this child. We have given fluid boluses. Albumin infusion also has been started. Yes. And now, uh, this child, we have started initially dopamine that was not responding. So, adrenaline has been started. Yes. So, is there any scope of fluid? I think that is again, do a, a simple sonography, look at the IVC status that will tell us how adequately or inadequately you are filled up and that will help for fluid titration. One. Correct. Uh, secondly, role of adrenaline. Adrenaline is a, a wonder drug. 0.1 to 0.3 microgram. Generally, it has more action on beta 1 and beta 2 receptors. So, inotropy and chronotropy. And beyond 0.3, the alpha action also kicks in, which is a vasoconstrictor action. So, with this, initially, we started with 0.1 and then stepped up to 0.3, 0.4. So, good amount of inotropy, some amount of vasoconstrictor effect. And then the child has, I think, responded. Yeah. So, this adrenaline is a safe bet is in this, this thing. If you, are, if you don't know what is happening inside, you can start on adrenaline see the response to it, you can go a little higher. So, went up to 0.4. So, that's what uh, Abhijit pointed to say, I wanted to say is that we are giving a low dose, little vasodilatory effect is there. As you step up, there is a vasoconstrictive effect as well as there is beta 1 action is there. So, inotropy is also increasing. When I said low role of uh, echo, what do you think? Like, what all things we need to see in the echo? See, the echo helps us in fine-tuning the inotropes and fluid therapy. Okay. And so, if you do the uh, echo, you can know the fluid status. Yes. So basically yes. the yes. preload. So it depends upon the IVC collapsibility. This child is ventilated. So definitely you can look at that. Yes. And if it's yes. less than 50%, uh, then definitely you can think of, you know, give more fluid. More fluid. See, many times as uh, Madam was saying that, you know, okay, we get always a mixed picture. Uh, warm shock, cold shock. Yes. Like uh, yes. there was a was vasoconstrictor or vasodilatory shock. So in that case, many times we find that, you know, even the child is periphery is cold and narrow pulse pressure. Uh, the, when you look at the, uh, the echo heart, there is still a lot of uh, uh, scope to give fluid. Yes. Now, the child so is still under is one fluid. Thing, yeah. So yeah, fluid yeah. It helps in fluid Definitely management. Definitely helps in fluid management. When you eyeball the contractility, it will tell you whether the, what is the card, cardiac, cardiac function is. You know, if the function is poor and definitely will look for inotropy, the, the, the drug which has got better inotropy action. Okay. Correct. So Correct. fluid therapy, your inotropy, and of course, requirement of a pressure effect. Yes. Uh, yes. Whether you need vasopressors and it will help you to uh, fine tune, you know, depending upon all these three factors. Yeah. So very well taken. Uh, echoes are right now very important in fine tuning what inotropes we should add and what doses we should give, whether fluids are required or not. So over here, the ejection fraction was around, uh, sorry. 
yeah and at the same time you know sometimes if there is uh, something like cardiac tamponade you know sometimes you can see in you know uh, dengue or uh, some uh, septic shock you know that that can be also looked at you know sometimes something which is obstructing the cardiac heart function so okay this child had an echo uh, fortunately we got an echo done and it showed a, a ejection fraction of 30% so uh, we added dobutamine to this child okay yeah, yeah. so uh, we added dobutamine in this child and uh, the shock improved this since the child had a cardiogenic element to it the shock improved and the, uh, the blood culture meanwhile grew MRSA. It was sensitive only to vancomycin linezolate. The child was already on vancomycin and the, ch the child fortunately improved and is right now also in the hospital doing well. So how do we monitor a patient for shock reversal? Now we are de detecting how to detect a shock. Now how do you look for shock? Uh, Dr. Minasar, how do you look for shock reversal? What points are you looking at? Well, you know, shock management is continuous process. And then we have to like see something called as therapeutic endpoints. Yes. So therapeutic endpoints are clinical as well as laboratory, more of clinicals. So we have to see, see, for example, improvement in the, your heart rate, improvement in the blood pressure, your skin temperature is better, CRT has improved. And then one of the important thing is perfusion, organ perfusion, urine output. If urine output is improved, things are on the right track. And of course, if you have luxury of having the lactate, Reversal of lactate train is one of the important things in shock management and shock monitoring. Very good. So we should have a look at uh, the but what if, goals we started with. Yeah. So we had a poor perfusion. So look for perfusion index indices clinically as well as lab wise. Look for the improvement in urine output, sensorium, peripheral perfusion. Look for organ perfusion as rightly said by Sir. Look at lactate. So ma'am, when do we start about thinking about de-escalation of the inotrope? Since we have started on two inotropes. What is the first one you come off and what endpoints are we so looking at? The first one would to come off would be the one that's at a higher and at a dangerous level. Correct. It's making the child cold, it is imp impeding perfusion, or you feel that it's causing a tachycardia. So whatever is harming the child, you will reduce first. Now it's not that if the noradrenaline is there, I have to reduce it down to zero and then reduce the other one. Yeah. What we generally do is alternate try not to do two at a time. And how fast you do it depends entirely on the situation you're facing. Sometimes dengue, for example, re will reverse so fast, you can de-escalate very, very rapidly. I mean, if you're making dal makhani, you'll put it on a very low simmer, but if you're boiling an egg, you'll push it up very high and switch it off very fast also. Yes. So it's the same thing here. It all depends on the underlying disease, the reversal of the disease, and how your child is responding. Thank you, ma'am. So very important point over here is the dangerous one comes off first. It's not that the first one comes off and then the second one comes off. So you have to keep on titrating and bedside is the best way to see which of which inotrope and how to de-escalate. De so even de-escalation is an art. It's not a, a equation, which is like one plus one is two. So again, as in escalation, de-escalation also, you should give the patient time and see how he responds. Now let's come to the next case. This was a six month old baby with a very short history of fever, cough and breathlessness. Child was lethargic when he came. He had fever, there was rapid breathing, short bursts of crying was there and the child was not feeding. Admitted in a peripheral hospital for bronchiolitis, referred to us for dropping sensorium and increasing work of breathing. The child was drowsy, had tachycardia, cold extremities. Again, uh, what our old cold shock was. This is cold extremities, poor pulses, central pulses were just palpable, CRT was prolonged. The blood pressure was again a wide pulse pressure. Tachypnea was there, work of breathing was increased, saturation was maintained on NR NRM. There was a tender hepatomegaly, and the RS didn't show any adventitious sounds. So the child was referred for bronchiolitis, but the chest was not th that bad. There were a few basal crepts, and the gallop was heard. This was the X ray on admission. We see a very large heart, prominent bronchiovascular markings, in, especially in the hilar perihilar region. So is it is it cardiac, Dr. Vinay sir? If you look at that, this is a typical presentation of any cardiac disease. Yeah. Okay, I think it is. Normally, we won't see so clear picture. Yeah. But I think if there is, um, if you look at the heart rate, it is a 180 per minute, poor perfusion, uh, uh, then 
galloprethrum is there yeah, tender poor hepatomegaly. feeding associated tender hepatomegaly yeah. and uh, tender hepatomegaly and short history of you know viral prodrome yeah. to start with so i think it fits into that so it looks like more of a uh, myocarditis cardiac involvement yeah myocarditis cardiomyopathy i think doesn't matter right, I, right I, now doesn't matter yeah. right now doesn't matter i think i'll take it as a cardiogenic shock so mina sir what choices we have we have done given oxygen head up is there uh, we have attached uh, ecg monitor we have sent some investigations echo was done we showed ejection fraction of 20% would you like to go some for some other investigations see the, at this point of time the priority is to optimize the stabilization Absolutely. Time. that's important investigation can wait wait if at all i have to investigate i will look for the effect of shock the investigations for that investigation for myocarditis or cardiomyopathy the list is exhaustive Yes. you can do at later point of time that's what i will do yeah. great, great one thing uh, this is the period where alkapa presents yeah, yeah. okay so they you know Look don't just colonies. carried away by myocarditis yeah. six month old child presenting with this picture always coronary should be looked for okay. and there should be mentioned you know echocardiography yes. report is yes. very important point well taken sir yeah yeah so abhijit would like to add you like to yeah. want what investment you want like right now like you want calcium right yeah calcium, calcium is the one which we have yeah so would you give fluids to this child or start, straight away start on lasix cardiac shock eto well of course you know we have been talking all about for first fill the tank yeah okay but don't fill too over over here because it's a cardiac patient we have to be very careful so just give a small bolus of 5 ml per kg Correct. see if the child is responsive Correct. the child is not there. been feeding well yeah Yeah, if your tachycardia increases, your new appearance of renal septicemegaly, this child does not needs more lot of fluids, fluids over here. You have to go for other measures. Correct. With regard to frosamide, at particular point of time when you hemodynamic optimize, we have to decongest it. That's it. with Abhi, regard to calcium. Yes, optimization yeah. of calcium is very important. It's as if you know calcium is said to be a kind of you know have a you know tropic in terms of. So we have to optimize the calcium. We don't have to under it. We have don't have to over it. Just optimize it. Yes. So all has its role in a proper amount of time. Abhijit, would you like to start a child on anionotrope? Yeah, I think uh, when we have started with five mLs per kg and we are seeing the response. At the same time, we have got a documented echo with ejection fraction of thirty percent. So we need to start here a anionotrope. Yeah. Now, uh, as uh, we have multiple agents. But here are the pure inotropes which are going to be more relevant, at least to begin with. And here I would prefer ino dilator like a dobutamin or a milrinone to be started initially. Yeah. Now milrinone also has a bolus dose to be given at the or loading mm. dose is what is called as. But I would avoid that. Absolutely. We'll start only with a maintenance dose, and I think it works well. Yes. So dobutamin yes. or a milrinone to be started Correct. with adequate dilution. This child is into myocarditis. i would not put a central line right now now let him stabilize a little bit and then after a few hours we would be targeting that okay uh, what about the role of digoxin ace inhibitors right now in shock management no no i no. think they are for the chronic right now they are not yeah. required what about these fans quite low absolutely quickly i know i know true Yeah, so, so, so made at some point of time make have the like you know decrease the blood pressure. Yeah, very yeah, very fancy. This is not the same uh, time to use. Liver cement. Yeah, yeah. ma'am. If this child turned out to be a cardiomyopathy, uh, had a dilated cardiomyopathy. So, ma'am, what uh, this child was not coming. I mean, as soon as you used to uh, come down on the inotrope, deescalate the inotrope, the child used to have again uh, dropping numbers like urinary used to drop. Uh, the child used to become tachypneic. so uh, how do we go, go for a long term uh, management i think long term management has to include all the possible supports digoxin there will be the pros and the cons uh, maybe my age tells it but i still think digoxin is a very useful drug in these situations yes and many of them don't come off uh, the ventilatory support as soon as you drop the ventilatory support mm -hmm. the positive pressure they start decompensating again which makes it a little tricky uh long term i like you said we've learned very uh, soon that all what we always thought was myocarditis are actually congenitally and uh, genetically acquired cardiomyopathies yes. so uh it's important to send out the genetics to make sure because these kids then go on the transplant list even if they have a myocarditis 30% may do fine 
30% may have long-term cardiac failure, and 30% may actually go to the transplant route. So this is not a good condition. We can't tell the parents that your child is going to be fine. Probably the child is not going to be fine in the long term. Absolutely. Unless it's a very brief, something like calcium or a COVID-related. We've seen the COVID-related ones come out really very well. Fast, yeah. So unless it's a specific reason, they don't really do very well. As far as the combination of cardiac support is concerned, I, I believe may be a better person to say that. Uh, see, for the cardiac support, as Madam talked about uh, digoxin, I think ACE inhibitors play a very important role. Very important, yes. Yeah. So, yes. ACE inhibitors and diuretics. diuretics. I think these are the two things, you know, we should, uh, yes. they, they go on. But not in shock, once the child is out of shock. Once the child, you know, once we discharge the child. Very good. Excellent, excellent. We have excellent discussion. Yes. Yes. But that's a bridge to transplant. You don't live your life on so we'll just sum up what we have discussed till now. Now, inotropic drugs are the therapies which enhance myocardial contractile performance independent of changes in heart rate and loading conditions. Positive inotropic drugs are indicated when patients if there is acute systolic heart failure when they exhibit signs and symptoms of end organ dysfunction or hyperperfusion. We have a plethora of drugs, adrenaline, noradrenaline, isoprenaline, dopamine, dobutamine, Positive inotropes are the ones which increase the card contractility of myocardium. Negative ones are which decrease the myocardial contractility. Chronotropes are the ones which increase the heart rate. Vasodilators are the ones which act on the smooth muscle relating in increasing in the uh, vasodilatation. And vasopressors are the ones which constrict the smooth muscles and leading to vasoconstriction. So quick two, two words. Abhijit, would you like to talk on dopamine? Any role? Yeah, as of now, not, we are not using it much. much. But if you are in resource limited settings, if you just want to start something before referring, you may consider. Yes. Shaikh sir, what about dobutamine? Dobutamine is useful in cardiac condition, but be careful. Whenever you start dobutamine, two things to look at. Number one is heart rate. Number one is blood pressure. So Great. once you start dobutamine, be on the bedside. Mm. Monitor according and try to record it. Thank you, sir. Uh, Vinay sir, not epinephrine? Yeah, yeah, I think the, it's a drug to go yeah in any kind go of to, shop for the go to drug go to drug yes go to drug or like uh, any kind of shop but i think always keep in mind that it increases svr significantly if your card contacted is poor then you need to support the heart as well correct 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 ma'am what about adrenaline adrenaline has its uses yeah. i mean look at adrenaline it's an old drug we've mm -hmm. used it a lot say you were you had to carry one drug with you, you were not allowed to carry anything else, probably adrenaline would be your a drug of bet. choice. It's a say it's an ionotrope. It is also it doesn't over constrict unless you're using it in very high doses. It uh, will help the heart push the heart as well as push the blood vessels. So if you had one drug to take, it would be adrenaline. Great. And of course, we are not talking about vasopressin at all, I think. Uh, we are on. Uh, okay. What about milrinone, ma'am? Milrinone, again, much like dopamine, a supportive drug. A Costly. good lusitropic action. It relaxes the right ventricle and certainly helps. So when you're on adrenaline, vasopressin at higher doses, you're seeing the vasoconstrictive action. Milrinone is a great drug for that. You see the urine start coming. You see the heart no, start relaxing. No. It does help. So Madam mentioned lusitropy. It is in, in conditions when there is diastolic dysfunction. The heart is not able to fill well. Milrinone has a good lusitropic action. It improves the cardiac filling and hence it improves cardiac output. Again, uh, <clears throat> uh, does not lead to increased myocardial oxygen consumption. So hence a bet, better bet than dobutamine. Uh, these two, three formula uh, is one which actually we should look at. DO2 is a delivery of oxygen to the tissues. It is dependent upon the content of oxygen and the cardiac output. So if the content of oxygen is less, CO2 is less, that means the hemoglobin is less. You get up the hemoglobin. It will improve the delivery of oxygen. If your cardiac output is less, then look at the systemic uh, uh, system of vascular resistance and the heart rate. And accordingly, uh, the stroke volume and the heart rate. And improve the stroke volume whenever possible. Target a good map. The mean arterial pressure should be good. It depends upon the cardiac output and the system of vascular resistance. If you have, to, you have to maintain a good map, then either increase the SVR or, or increase the cardiac output.
so uh, uh, we have a few take home messages this is a very good chart which i uh, which i found out which showed that the various physiologic effects of the drug so basically what uh, we want to say is very important point is none of the drugs work on an empty heart so we need to fill up be it a cardiogenic shock also though the volume and the time on which we want to give fluids will be different there is no single magic drug which works always so the things keep on changing so you need to target a, what is the pathophysiology what is happening so you should know what is happening inside accordingly you can do things on the outside always remember rigid protocols fail be flexible things may not work what you want and what and the best person to tell you this is the patient so keep on looking at the patient he will be the best guide to you <coughs> shock is a dynamic process it changes within minutes a hypovolemic shock may go into a septic shock may go into a cardiac shock within few minutes to hours so be at the bedside bedside is the best place to monitor and the things we have been taught in pediatrics since day 1 is keep on looking at the patient the patient will tell you what is his requirement what is the things which you need to uh, 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 go, keep on going the same drug this this slide i borrowed from dr parmanand sir and he is very uh, fond of this sentence the same drug may not work in the same situation so you cannot say ha dengue shock ala to mahala dobutamine shuru karun dya because in the previous dobut uh, uh, dengue patient dobutamine had worked so the same drug may not work in the same patient a uh, same situation and the same drug drug may not work in the same patient also so initially maybe the blood pressure came up with dopamine but it may not always come up with dopamine keep things keep on changing in the body so you keep on monitoring the patient and always remember change is the only constant in constant in the pcu in the nicu and obviously in life so get used to change find the change and treat the change thank you uh we would like to have some questions because i am i'm sure many of you must be having questions no questions all of us thank you thank you my panelists just wait all the panelists please uh, i'll request dr tarun kanade sir to felicitate dr udani ma'am amol amol felicitation felicitation thank you ma'am i'll request uh, dr tarun to felicitate dr joshi sir thank you for your valuable time sir request dr tarun to felicitate dr sheikh sir thank you sir request dr tarun to felicitate dr abhijit sir thanks to all the panelists for your valuable time it means a lot L learnt a lot like we can do a new entrepreneurship we can buy a echocardiogram machine and run from one intensive care to another intensive care thank you sir uh, uh, i'll request dr chopra sir to felicitate dr tarun kanade sir thank you tarun for the lucid moderation thank you sir टी ट्वेंटी हो गया वर्ल्ड कप आने वाला है गुगलीज वुगलीज तो चलते रहती है
Now we will be seeing googlies in leukemia. Dr. Nitin Shah is an esteemed hematologist uh, from uh, Bombay. Sir will be uh, taking the session, next session, googlies in leukemia. I request Dr. Nitin Shah, sir, thank you, sir. Uh, I'll request uh, Chairperson Dr. Shripa Jahangirdar to kindly grace the stage. And I'll also request Dr. Jayashri Suryanshi, ma'am, to kindly grace the stage. To us, Delhi Bay journals, leukemia itself is a googly. Although we are aware that almost all leukemia somewhere begins with fever, generalized weakness, apathy, and only in the latter stages with anemia, frequent infections, petechiae, etc. We cannot even muster the courage to announce to the relatives that your child has blood cancer. A hemat-oncologist can do this as simply as if they are announcing a flu. The googly does not end here. Types of leukemia, involvement beyond the bloodstream, the complication, and the entire variety of therapies for various stages of leukemia is what we are here to learn from our esteemed hematologist, Dr. Nitin Shah, sir. Stage is all yours, sir. Thank you. So with the permission of the chair, I will start my talk on, I mean, this is a very uh, different topic uh, suggested by Sharmila. So I said, let me give some thought as to what will I show to a general pediatrician? Because I said the word leukemia itself means general pediatricians refer wherever the patient wants to go. So let's say a prototype case, a four-year-old male child has high fever for 15 days. <clears throat> He's got weight loss for 15 days. Now, when you have weight loss, you should say, how much is the weight loss? So it's more than 10% over the last three to six months is significant. Many times the weight is not available. Then you say, okay, is the child's clothes are becoming more loose than before? The parents are very smart. Usually they know this weight loss is something which is very unusual. So always when you have children with PUO, look whether they're sick or not sick. I mean, for those of you who attended Vijay Vishwanathan's talk in a brilliant talk in the morning, he would also kept on saying that whether it's a sick child, it's not his case, it's not sick child, then it's his case. So the child has got obviously a huge liver and a spleen, he's a very sick looking child, he's pale, he's got general lymphadenopathy, <clears throat> and you order a CBC and this is what the CBC comes back. He's got moderate anemia, which is normocytic, normochromic, so surely it is not nutritional cause, his WBC counts are extremely low. Whenever you have WBC count, make it a habit to count ANC, absolute neutrophil count, and ALC, absolute lymphocyte count. And you can see here 10% neutrophil make the ANC only 260, normal being at least 1000, ideally 1500 plus. So obviously this child has got severe neutropenia and the platelets also are 34,000. So it's got a true pancytopenia, which is severe. And this is what his clinical picture looks like. Uh, on the left, you have the child who's got this huge liver and spleen and a sick look, generalized lymphadenopathy. You can see cervical, you can see inguinal. And if you had not stripped this patient, you would have missed this testicular swelling. So this is a prototype case. I mean, this is a blinder. If you do not diagnose this case, I think you have to go back to medical school because this is something you should never mess around with giving them antibiotics, for sure not give them blood transfusion or steroids and thing like that and just refer them if you are not able to manage them and diagnose well. So you do a peripheral smear and a marrow, you will see either an ALL or an AML and that the case is solved. But unfortunately, we only read books. Diseases don't read books and come. So diseases are not going to come like this prototype case, which even uh, undergraduate students will be able to make out. So I will show you six cases where it's actually leukemia, but say something beyond and it's really uh, baffling as to how do you come to the conclusion. So let's begin with those googlies. So first case is a fire female child. She's got fever, which is quite moderate, 100 to 101 Fahrenheit for a few weeks. So by definition, she's definitely like a PUO. She's got pain in the small joints for one month. Uh, there was no weight loss. There was no lymph node or no purpura. So basically what looks like a PUO with a joint swelling. Now, again, the confusion, whether the patient goes first to Vijay Vishwanathan or comes to me. So he's a well child. So probably you'll say after he's listening to his story, okay, he should go there. He's febrile, is mildly pale. There is no other telltale sign like lymph node or liver spleen, just palpable liver spleen. And he has got no swelling of the 
joints of hand and feet when he came to you though there was some uh, history of uh, small joint pain so again there is no great clue except that now he has got some mild hepatosplenomegaly now this is a cbc with which he comes to you hemoglobin is 8 grams so when you have anemia look at the mcv and the rdw it will help you a lot in practice if you have a low mcv and high rdw you know there is iron deficiency maybe your case try to treat them see the response after one month and three months cbc everything becomes okay forget about it if you have a low mcv and a normal rdw it may be thalassemia minor investigate further if you have a normal mcv and a normal uh, a no normal rdw it is normocytic normochromic it is not your cup of tea sort of it is either chronic inflammation infection infiltration malignancy <clears throat> so many other causes so that's where you have now this is moderate normocytic normochromic anemia the wbc count shows that the wbc is 7800 the neutrophils are 20 lymphocytes are 70 monocytes are 10 <clears throat> many of the viral infections will come like this the platelet count is 1.6 lakh which is more than 1.5 lakh so is normal the asr is 60 the crp is 24 and repeated cbcs have been done in past they have shown a very similar picture so the patient is neither dropped too much or not has improved too much over the time patient is seen by a pediatric rheumatologist so he goes of course well child high asr go to rheumatologist so he orders for ra ana and he asks for ultrasound joint it shows there is some synovitis his ana is positive <clears throat> he diagnoses so gia or we learned today we dropped that word oh it is sagia okay started on oral steroids given for 6 weeks and then tapered to small dose to maintain the child symptom free patient apparently well for 3 months now fever recurs now he becomes even more pale than before now he has weight loss now his liver spleen size has gone up i <clears throat> came to hinduja hospital we see peripheral smear and there are blasts now bone marrow is done it confirmed that this acute leukemia the flow shows that is acute lymphoblastic leukemia any cytogenetics are sent as always the point to find out the stratification of the risk of the uh, outcome so it's hyperploidy which means there are more number of chromosomes than 46 now hyperploidy is a good prognostic feature in children if you have a child who is standard risk all with hyperploidy he has got more than 92 to 95% chances of permanently in remission or what we call cured after 5 years but now he is actually a relapse all because he has received heavy dose of steroid in the past and has come with a sort of a relapse picture so from a very low risk very good outcome all He has become now a high risk ALL because of the previous use of steroid. So now we have to give guarded prognosis. Of course, this is not a truly relapsed ALL in that sense. When we say a relapsed ALL is one who has undertaken the proper treatment for his leukemia and has now relapsed. So that means he is now drug resistant to all the five six drugs that you have used in past. So the year only single drug was used that is steroid. But still, it will make his outcome little more worse than what it was if he had been diagnosed at the Uh, first sight itself so what mistakes happen in this child counts and platelets are not suggestive of sogia what are the counts wbc 7800 we said the counts are 20000 30000 40000 they have neutro predominance neutros are 80% 90% which is not the case the platelets are high it's an inflammatory response so there will be 6 lakh 7 lakh platelet count whereas this child didn't have this type of picture peripheral smear was not seen by an expert i again re repeat again and again even in the best of the best cts the pathologists just don't have time to see the smear they are busy signing the reports which come out of a machine and that's it in fact you will see many times cbc where the i mean how do you know the smear is seen by the pathologists or no is look at the report if the report shows that the neutrophils are 36.5% and lymphocytes are 60.8% which means they are the machine counts which are given and they are just typed out that means no one has seen the smear and no one has seen actually what it looks like okay between me and vijay it's a deuce that if he is not comfortable with the patient he will not start steroid without me doing a marrow and i think doing marrow is actually even simpler than putting an iv line in a 1.5 kilo or a 1 kilo preterm child you may struggle for half an hour putting a line in a preterm child whereas marrow takes literally 2 minutes If you are expert and if you know how to do a marrow, aspiration is so simple a procedure. In fact, all my ATP patients, unless they have significant mucosal bleed, I don't admit them. I call them in the morning on empty stomach. If they are small child 
uh, do under sedation if they are bigger child I explain them and do under local anesthesia a bone marrow and send them away in one or two hours time see the smear in the uh, afternoon at my home or in my lab evening report is given steroid started and that's the end of it so doing marrow is not a hazardous procedure biopsy yes something which you may not want to do something we may not have been trained to do something which definitely needs a sedation and an institute but aspiration is a simple thing so i always tell them that how you remove blood from way and i remove blood from the bone so then they think it's not a big operation. Otherwise, parents come with the, that it's a big operation. And many times, parents confuse bone marrow with CSF. So someone has told them, So they think bone marrow also is going to lead to some drastic problem. So bone marrow is something which you should not shy of doing in your practice. And I, believe me, you will be rewarded sometime in your practice. In fact, I get marrows from pediatrician after I, they listen to me and they are confident of doing they do marrow and send to me for reporting for two reasons. One, they get a clinical pathological correlation. Number two, they send a smear in the evening. Night, I tell them the report because I stand at my home and see the slide. Okay, and then follow up. If there's any problem, the patient can always come to me. So like that, you can learn to do bone marrows and send to either pathologist, bigger laboratory or to anyone who is around who can interpret the bone marrow. So the follow-up CBC was not done till three months when the patient was on a steroid. If it is done before, you would have seen that the patient is now becoming pancytopenic before he actually comes to you. So a low risk ALL now turns into high risk ALL will need toxic chemotherapy protocol like a relapse or a high risk disease, poor outcome and potential transplant. So when in doubt, always do a bone marrow is the outcome of this case number one is going to be repeated again and again in the next few cases. <clears throat> Let's move to the second case. A three year old male child pale since one month and fever since two days. There's no cough, no cold, no focus, no weight loss, no lymph node, no purpura, no bony pain. Simple infection may be recurrent many times. Uh, I mean, uh, if you look at the NFHS 5, the National Family Health Survey 5 data, which has just come out, including Maharashtra and Gujarat, the prevalence of anemia is 65 to 70% in children. So it's, it's, it's a rule that a child who comes to your clinic is going to be pale, especially more in the periphery, more the underprivileged children, more likely to be having pallor because of nutritional anemia. So this child has just pale out since one month and fever for two days. So he was pale, he was afebrile when he, he was seen by the pediatrician and there was nothing to suggest either lymphadenopathy, organomegaly or joints, everything was normal. Now investigation, CBC was something which was alarming to the pediatrician. He saw that the hemoglobin is four gram. Now again, what do you do next? Look at the MCV and RDW, MCV is 75. It is little low, but not that low. You cannot have iron deficiency with four gram hemoglobin and MCV was 75. Your MCV has to be 50, 45, 55 like that. And your RDW will be sky high. Of course, I have not given you RDW here, but that was normal in this child. So this is obviously not a nutritional anemia. WBC is 4,500. 30 neutro, 65 poly, and 5% uh, monocyte, and a platelet of 1.2 lakhs. Now, because you have dengue, malaria, viral infection, so many where you see low platelets, he said, okay, this looks like just some uh, nutritional anemia, like maybe, and uh, child is so pale, he will go into failure. Now, child is so pale, he will go into failure. Is he in failure is what the question to ask. So when I take round in Vadia hospital and someone has given such a child blood transfusion, previous day, they for sure know, at least they fudged the data to say that, no, sir, he had severe tachycardia and his liver was palpable and tender, which means he's telling me the child was in failure. I had no choice but to give him, uh, because I will fire him if he gives blood transfusion without asserting the cause. Blood transfusion is symptomatic therapy. It is not therapeutic therapy. It helps you to tide over crisis. Try to investigate to find out the cause of anemia before you transfuse is a general dictum. The only exception is someone who is in overt or occult failure. So look at the hepatojugular reflux, JVP, tender hepatomegaly and tachycardia and associated respiratory illness. Because if they have associated respiratory illness, they cannot tolerate uh, this type of hemoglobin uh, that easily as compared to a child who is otherwise walking and talking. You will have several iron deficiency coming, walking to you with four gram hemoglobin. Don't even admit them and do anything. Just give them iron if this suffices the criteria of low MCV, high IDW and without any organomegaly. All right, so what does the child pediatrician do? Child was admitted at a peripheral hospital, given ceftriaxone and packed red blood cell over two days. All right, now he improved. Obviously, he will improve because anemia improved. It discharged after five days. After three weeks, again, he starts having high-grade fever, pallor, and now skin ulcers on both the lower limbs. 
so he goes to panvel to dr mohit's place he was very sick child had this necrotic patches on the tibia which are like a gangrene like highly febrile child pale and sick looking he was like in a septic shock like now look at this cbc hemoglobin is back to 5 so the pediatrician had not even done a repeat cbc after blood transfusion to see what has happened to the other counts so follow up cbcs are extremely important in hematology there is no spot diagnosis is always a serial uh, cbc which makes you help diagnose now the wbcs are fallen further there are hardly any neutrophil the platelets have fallen the crp is jump sky high patient is transferred in a septic shock like picture so we receive a sepsis blood cultures and wool cultures sent uh, he was transfused prbc started on meropenem and vancomycin pending the culture reports his bone marrow aspiration showed dry tap there was nothing not a drop of blood would come like a dry like a uh, uh, like like you are trying to hit a wall bone marrow biopsy was done very difficult to do biopsy in such a sick child when you receive i mean it's not an easy job okay the wound and the blood culture grew pseudomonas and cirrhosis the cirrhosis is something which you grow only in an immune compromised host so obviously this child was very sick and immune compromised so the antibiotics were changed according to the culture sensitivity and the patient continued to have high fever the bone marrow biopsy report came it showed that there is absolutely wiped out marrow and there is one focus where some suspicious lymphoblasts are seen were not enough to make diagnosis kindly repeat the bone marrow biopsy now how do you do that in a sick child like this so flow is not possible immunohistochemistry is not possible so i tell my uh, hematopathologist from hinduja hospital let both go with his biopsy to dr gujral dr gujral from tata is an extremely nice person and a very experienced hematopathologist so he saw the uh, biopsy he said i am sure that cluster is lymphoblast i mean he said from my experience i tell you is lymphoblast i can't do isc because it's a small cluster so now what do you do what is the proof for diagnosis leukemia what do you treat with and if it is leukemia believe me till his neutrophil counts will come up he will not survive because he you give tons of antibiotic to someone his neutrophils are zero he is not going to survive the case and that to a fresh leukemia is a febrile neutropenia in a child who is on maintenance is okay you can always give him uh, gcsf and increase his counts here the gcsf is not going to help the marrow is packed with the blast so we decided with consent of the parent that we will treat as all and a repeat marrow after one or two weeks when the child is symptomatic better because no all protocol will make the marrow get empty within 10 15 days time all right so we started on oral steroid one dose of ls was given and wound debridement was done under platelet cover i mean it's a challenging case really patient improved on day 5 with neutrophil recovery fever started subsiding now it could be because i treated a sepsis and i treated the source of infection how do i know is leukemia we repeat a marrow on day 14 now it shows 3% lymphoblast on isc now normally you don't have a 3% 5% lymphoblast someone who has received an all protocol and has 3% blast on day 14 in retrospective now i know i i was right in treating them as all okay so we complete this all treatment protocol child survived and now is off chemotherapy following for last 3 years so such a rewarding case but made so difficult why what mistakes happened blood transfusion was given without ascertaining the cause of anemia without a follow up cbc mind you we see at least 3 to 4 cases every year who have seemingly normal count have received blood transfusion and come with leukemia after 2 or 3 months have received steroids for 10 15 days like the first child enough to make someone go into temporary remission come back with a relapse after 2 or 3 months so he was given blood transfusion without ascertaining the cause he might have received steroids as efcorlin with the blood transfusion how many of you give steroid uh, steroid and antihistamine routinely with every blood transfusion it is not required lasix it is not required if you have a child who is in failure give him small alicot of paxil do not give lasix do not give efcorlin do not give antihistamine is not required especially if you are using packed red blood cell which are filtered which are usually the case in most of the good blood bank you don't get fevers you don't get uh, any reaction to the blood okay again peripherals we are at the first instant were not seen by an expert if i go back to his first cbc you can see here his wb was 4500 with 30% poly so around 1200 to 1300 was the absent neutrophil count that you raise your tentacle that you have such severe anemia with a borderline low platelet of 1.2 and a borderline low anc 
this child may become leukemia or may become okay with as a uh, viral infection which is recovering do cbcs serially and demonstrate that the counts have gone up that was not done all right uh, so this is what we call hypoplastic onset of leukemia it is not uncommon and it will be difficult but if the patient is not received steroid or blood transfusion in past then biopsy is easy to do at least but in this case because of such a horrible condition even biopsy was uh, difficult to do always keep unstained smear if you get suppose you have a child like this in your peripheral hospital you want to transfuse okay make peripheral smears okay if you can't do bone marrow send those unstained smear along with the patient to some expert to say that whether they can see blast etc and again when in doubt do the bone marrow so that you don't miss such cases okay third case five female child presented with jaundice and dark urine for two weeks fever for three weeks and loss of appetite so presentation like an acute hepatitis she was deeply icteric to the pediatrician where she went liver was palpable spleen was palpable and these are the investigation hemoglobin was 9 grams which was normocytic normochromic you can see mcv is 88 wbc was bang normal anc was bang normal platelets were bang normal so mild anemia which can be seen in any viral infection including viral hepatitis so so far history is like a acute viral hepatitis bilirubin is 10 at 18 with direct or 12 indirect or 6 sgot and sgp are in thousands Uh, and sgpt is more than sgot so more like to be some infection ggt is little high total proteins are okay and he says okay we do all viral markers so he sends for hepatitis a igm surface antigen for hepatitis b igm hepatitis c uh, and uh, igm for hepatitis e and all come negative so he label this as viral marker negative acute hepatitis now you can't call it viral because we don't have an evidence of a viral infection patient was given symptomatic treatment fever subsided but the icterus still persists so follow up cbcs and lfts are done lft show fluctuating sometimes some improvement in the bilirubin and sgot sgpt but the child is still not having completely normal lft even after few weeks that's very unusual again now one cbc has shown hb of 10.5 wbc of 4500 with 25 and 75 polylympho platelet of 1.1 lakh and mco of 82 now in the thick bunch of papers of serial cbcs lft viral marker etc one such cbc is completely missed make it a point when you see a report tick it so you know you have seen this report i mean you'll be surprised sometime peripheral smears for mp is positive in a bunch of 20 report that you have sent and you have forgotten to see that one peripheral smear report and you don't know what the cause is when you have actually so when you ask for report at least see them properly okay seen by a senior pediatrician as a second opinion work up for autoimmune hepatitis and wilsons is done both of them are normal that means the lkm antibodies are not there uh, cerebral plasmin and copper studies are normal after 6 weeks fever recurs now high grade and patient referred to me at hinduja we have a young febrile girl who started with idiopathic acute hepatitis and has come now with this type of cbc hemoglobin has fallen neutrophil counts are 800 platelets are 70000 we do is ldh and uric acid both of them are high telling you high cell turnover okay which is not the case in a acute hepatitis the bilirubin is still high 25 direct to 19 sgot sgpt are still in thousands so still behaving like an acute hepatitis the peripheral smear shows lymphoblast the marrow is full of lymphoblast and the flow show that she has got acute lymphoblastic leukemia now we have dilemma most of the chemotherapeutic agents used for leukemia cannot be given with abnormal lft so she has high lf bilirubin and high sgot sgpt steroids can be used with some constraint but you can't use l aspergillus you cannot use intrathecal methotrexate you cannot use uh, uh, any of the other drugs which we standardly use including vincristine because it can lead to severe neuropathy donamycin is out you can't use anthracycline so how do you induce her into a remission so we start with small dose oral steroid low dose vincristine and low dose araci because these are safe drug and we gave one dose of rituximab because that also works uh, in a leukemic child patient improved over two weeks with normalization of lft which means the blasts were clogging the liver and that's why her lft was not improving if you kill the blast with some sub therapeutic type of chemotherapy and the blast started disappearing and now we restart entire protocol after two weeks and so the induction goes on instead of 4 weeks to 6 weeks 
patient improved and then patient was completed on the ALL protocol. She is now five years of chemotherapy following up and she is now a long term survivor or what we call a cured patient. So here there was a diagnostic dilemma for the pediatrician because the presentation was like an acute hepatitis and a therapeutic dilemma for me when she came to me because I didn't know which drug to use and how to induce such a patient. So what mistakes? One CBC has shown low ANC and low platelet and I repeat that 25 over 45 is less than 1200 ANC and a plate of 1.1 lakh should have raised the suspicion and at least that time a smear should have been sent by an expert. Follow-up CBC was not done thereafter to see for the trend of the counts and I repeat, repeated trends of the counts are more important than one single CBC and a PS is of course to be seen by anyone and when in doubt do a bone marrow. Okay, fourth case, nine-year female child presented with loss of appetite, 2.5 kilo weight loss in last six months and abdominal distension for two months. This was the only presenting symptom. She, there was no fever, body ache, lymph node, jaundice, blood transfusion, joint pain, swelling, etc. nothing. So she was catchect. You see her weight is 20 kilos, is in the third to 10th centile and height is 129 centimeter, which is 25th to 50th centile, which means she's quite okay for her height, but she has lost weight. So she's dropped in a centile for the weight. So she's like weight less than the height uh, type of uh, malnutrition or you don't get malnutrition, but you say she has lost weight. Now she's got a liver of nine centimeter below the right postal margin and the spleen is just palpable. There is no lymph node, no pallor. This child's CBC is absolutely normal. Hemoglobin is 13.5, WBC and differential are normal with a normal ANC, platelets are 2.4 lakh, peripheral smear is seen by us at Wadia Hospital. Uh, it is normal repeatedly. This patient, of course, was with the GI team at Wadia Hospital. So now they did an LFT, of course, which was normal. Renal function test was done, which was normal. Ultrasound abdomen was done, which showed moderate hepatomegaly, mild splenomegaly with a normal portal Doppler. So there was no obvious lesion in the liver, like a SOL or an abscess or a mass or a tumor or anything. Uh, viral markers for uh, hepatitis were negative. Her uh, ANA was weakly positive, but the autoimmune hepatitis workup like LKM and SM antibodies were negative. AP was done, which was normal. CT abdomen was done by them. It showed again a moderate hepatomegaly without any obvious cause for all this. Liver biopsy was done and it showed lymphoblasts. Now we do bone marrow. It is full of ALN. So this child has come with a completely normal CBC and only as a massive hepatomegaly without fever and the marrow is full of blasts. So we see at least two or three patients of ALL who have completely normal CBC. So a normal CBC does not rule out symptoms are matching a smear and maybe a marrow as a part of a PO workup or cachexia workup, etc. is mandatory uh, in such patients. All right. The last second last case before I will end with the last case, which is even more interesting. Uh, case five is two year male child presented with fever for three weeks, pallor for two weeks, liver two centimeter and spleen four centimeter. Now this child's CBC shows hemoglobin of 7.5, which is low. It is normocytic, normochromic. It's got a very low ANC, 15% of 3,400 is like less than 500. And the platelets are 65,000. So it's got severe pancytopenia. So PUO, pallor, hepatosomegaly, pancytopenia, diagnosis is either leukemia or HLH. So this patient was in Goa, of course. So the bone marrow aspiration was done by the pediatrician there. It was dry tap. He couldn't get a drop of uh, liquid marrow. So the smear showed that it's all diluted, only peripheral blood. They had done a bone marrow biopsy. Now it showed only cartilage. Remember, small children, biopsy should be done carefully. Choosing the right needle and the right depth to which you go is important. Many times you are so worried in such a small iliac crest, you tend to go very superficial, do a biopsy and come out. And all you see is only the cartilage and the actual marrow is deep inside. So the marrow looks red, whereas the cartilage looks white. So you should have a piece where there is a white piece and a red piece together. If you only red piece also is okay because that's the marrow you are interested in. But if you only the white piece, repeat the marrow there and then, because you are going to get a report like this, only cartilage seen. So cartilage seen some few foci of hemo, uh, hem hematopoiesis, which shows hemophagocytes. Now remember, hemophagocyte is a normal way by the marrow to clear the debris of dead cells in the marrow. It alone does not mince HLH. 
Now, after repeated talks on HLH, anything which is hemophagous in the marrow is not HLH. You have to satisfy those five out of seven criteria of the HLH which are there on the uh, website. So you must download and keep it ready with you. So this child, because dry tap biopsy shows hemophagous size, one of the differential is HLH. They do a ferritin, which is high, triglyceride, which is high, LFT, PT, APT is normal, uh, fibrin and also was normal, so normal. So they treated as HLH. So they gave IVIG and they gave methylprednisolone. Now there was absolutely no response to the patient. So patient then got uh, said, okay, we'll go to Bombay. So they came to me. All right. So at Hinduja, we have a child with PUO, pancytopenia, organomegaly, failed marrow, as well as failed response to HLH protocol. So obviously you have to change your diagnosis. So we do repeat CBC, hemoglobin is 5.6. Again, severe neutropenia and thrombocytopenia. Peripheral smear still does not show any blast. So what choice I have? I have to repeat a marrow. So I do a first, I do an LFT. It shows proteins are 5.2 with a very low albumin. Now, when you have a low albumin in an ALLA diagnosis, it is going to be a troublesome patient to treat because one of the risk factor for death in ALL is low albumin at the time of diagnosis. So all malnourished children with ALL are difficult to manage. Many of them die of sepsis. Uh, so his uric acid was little high. LDH was high. RFT, XHS were normal. So I repeat a marrow. The marrow shows that it's an acute myeloid leukemia. Now remember, there's something known as M7AML, megakaryocytic myeloid leukemia. Megakaryocytic myeloid leukemia, the marrows are very difficult to do. Aspiration will be always dry. And the biopsy also is because the marrow has so much of a, a fibrous tissue that he, the biopsy also needs an expert and really a lot of maneuvering to bring that piece out. So we, we did the marrow, it showed AML. He was started on the AML protocol, which is a standard. You give three days of donomycin, seven days of uh, ARAC, 24 hours drip, and I do a triple drug intrathecal and supportive care. Now patient responded well, the fever started subsiding. On day 15, he developed puffiness, edema fit, and tachypnea, and he became fibrinal neutropenic because of his severe chemotherapy. You expect counts to drop to near zero. All right, this is the X-ray. He has developed a massive effusion on the right side. So X-ray shows right-sided pleural effusion. Total proteins have fallen further to 3.2 and albumin only one gram. Create is normal. So we thought hypoalbuminemia as the cause of his uh, pleural effusion, edema, puffiness, etc. Gave him IV albumin for three days, but there was absolutely no response. The effusion was not becoming better, and the child was becoming more tachypnic. So next is to do an HRCT to find out uh, infection, because AMLs are very prone to fungal infections, remember. So it showed some infiltrates. So further investigation required for that. And these are those CT scan pictures which showed that there are infiltrates. So we did a serum and bal galactomanan, which came positive. So we diagnosed him as, as invasive aspergillosis, treated him with voriconazole, the patient started improving. Pleural effusion started disappearing. And on day 30 post chemo, his counts recovered. So now he's like going into a remission and a recovering marrow, and he was to be discharged. But the day he was to be discharged, he developed massive hematemesis and he collapsed. So immediately shifted to ICU. While intubating, they saw that the blood was oozing out of trachea-like tap. It's actually, actually not a hematosis, it was a hemoptysis. So why he got such massive hemoptysis? Uh, so he was immediately ventilated. He was requiring very high pressure support because obviously there was so much of blood in the lung. HBA dropped to four gram for, from a normal hemoglobin. WBC and platelet were still holding because he was already in remission. He was given the massive hemorrhage protocol, PRBC plated FFP, and an urgent CT pulmonary NGO was done. So, it was suggested of an NGO invasive pulmonary aspergillosis, which has now led to three pseudo aneurysms. Now that fellow is going to die unless you do something. So we counsel the parents that see, as such, is AML, M7, outcome without transplant is not good. He was so sick to start with two time marrow. Now he's bled so much. Uh, he's being ventilated. He's going to take a long time. Do you want any further treatment? So they say, no, we want everything to be done. So the, invas the intervention radiologist goes in and uh, puts three the glues in each of these three aneurysms. Luckily for us, the patient uh, uh, started improving, the bleeding stopped. He tolerated the procedure and was extubated on day five and discharged. He completed his remaining two or three cycles of the AML treatment and his and six months of voriconazole. A repeat CT showed that the lesions were disappeared. Now he's off chemo for one year and he's doing well. So we tend to give up many times. 
because you see enough is enough how much patient will spend you know don't be judgmental you never know what the patient can afford later on i came to know that that person's father is actually the panchayat head in goa so i'm sure he must be having a lot of money so looking at him you will feel how has he even entered hinduja hospital but actually you ask for money they'll bring out from one pocket second pocket here pocket are either a tera pocket and they'll have a loads of money so never be judgmental when treating a patient and never give up uh, in a treatable cause or at the last case i think the other hall anyway is running very late so we i can continue anyway this is the last case so this is interesting Now, i don't know it's just a theory maybe some senior people can help me here male child he was known case of barter syndrome this was pankaj deshpande patient he was treating him for barter since very early life the child had polyuria polydipsia this typical symptom uh, is now this child developed fever for 10 days uh, no weight loss and some leg pain so he went to pankaj he saw that the child is pale it's got just palpable liver and spleen so he asked for a cbc the hemoglobin showed hemoglobin of 7 gram WBC is four thousand three hundred with thirty percent poly, so the ANC is definitely low. The platelets are sixty-five, and they are also low. So obviously, it's got pan-cytopenia. So he said, "No, it's not my cup of tea." Now you go to Hinduja, get admitted. We need to do a marrow. So you get admitted. I do a bone marrow, especially completely normal. So I said, "Okay, give B twelve folate and maybe some viral infection follow." -up. He was discharged and asked to follow up on serial CBC done over next two three months. All counts were normal, and he was absolutely asymptomatic. Exactly after one year, he came back with fever for 15 days, some weight loss, and again that just palpable liver and spleen. This time again, he has come with pancytopenia, hemoglobin low, ANC is so even more low, 340, platelets are low, LDH is high, uric acid is high. I do a marrow; it is full of lymphoblasts, and it shows that flow shows that is acute lymphoblastic leukemia. Now, what happened? Did he have leukemia last time and he went to spontaneous remission? Did he not have leukemia last time? Then same picture again after one year. we have had this discussion in our group many time and we many of us feel of course we cannot prove it that leukemia is do undergo spontaneous remission either following viral infection or following steroids definitely following blood transfusion definitely or on their own we don't know i mean i can't explain this child how one year back exactly same presentation a normal marrow i mean you can say okay i missed the marrow or someone misdiagnosed they were blast but they were not seen he can't remain asymptomatic for one year i can imagine for one month so for one year he was absolutely asymptomatic and now he comes up with the same symptoms little more pancytopenia and the marrow is full of blast so god gives us only nuts to eat but we have to crack them before eating so the take home messages are do not give steroid without diagnosis in a puo do not give blood transfusion without diagnosis in an anemic child ps should be seen by an expert as far as possible you may tell your pathologist friend in a in a situation where there is something missing like puo some unknown anemia you take 1000 rupees to see one smear i don't mind but you see the smear yourself he if he knows what a blast looks like he will be able to pick up when in doubt do bone marrow as i said it is easier than putting iv line in a chubby infant or a premature baby and a bone marrow a must be for steroids in a suspected gi sle type picture because many time you may give steroid and may uh, mess up with the outcome at the end who may start as a low risk and turns out to be high risk only because we treated him with steroid without the diagnosis well thank you very much for your patient here so very nice presentation i must say many cases were googlies but some of them were dusra also <laughs> and sir has shown a very nice way how to tackle with this dusra and googly and very simple take home message that all pediatrician should carry thank, thank you. you very much for thank excellent you. talk thank you so much sir uh, what i learned today is when in doubt to bone marrow and blood transfusion a uh, definitely no no without ascertaining the cause of anemia you may have that patient may have received steroid with the bone transfusion so always be cautious peripheral smear must be read by the hematologist and do cbc serially which we do we we tend to forget in our busy schedule that's a definitely a learning lesson for us and most importantly us. whenever in doubt always Call him at all, or just use a phone call. <laughs> yes, definitely, sir. See, so, so on a serious note, people get very worried in taking opinions. Now, you think the patient will go away? Patient will go away in any way. He will go away. But if you have sent in time to a right person, he will come back to you for primary care. Remember, so you will earn a lot of goodwill. Whereas one such patient who done turned out to look him, not only he will not come back, he will tell ten more people not to go to you. So, taking opinion, you should never feel shy.
I'll request Dr. Suryanshi ma'am to felicitate Dr. Nitin Shah, sir. Nice. <laughs> I'll request Dr. Jahangirdar, sir, to give moment to Nitin Shah, sir. I'll request Dr. Dashaputre, sir, to felicitate Dr. Jahangirdar, sir. And I'll request Dr. Laddhar, sir, to felicitate Suryan Shri, ma'am. Thank you so much, Suryanshi ma'am, for giving your time. Thank you so much, Dr. Jahangidhar, sir, for your valuable time. The other hall is running late, so we'll be relaying the uh, talk from the other hall in this hall till we catch up the oration, which will also be relayed in this hall. Thank you.